Good afternoon and welcome to Women in Engineering and Technology 2024. We're thrilled that you could all join us today. We've got a huge amount of people watching online and we've got some people here that have traveled far and wide to join us here at the LSBU uh, University uh, here in the brand new Hub Lecture Theatre. My name is Amanda Thompson. I'm the owner and founder of Campus Media. Campus Media is a youth marketing company and we specialise in all things diversity. We work with institutions and employers to help educate um, and inspire early talent into um, the roles that the employers are looking for. So before we get started, um, if you didn't see the agenda cards uh, whilst you were waiting, well, on the screen now, we've got uh, the first half of the event that's coming up. Um, there will be a couple of breaks as well, and we've also got a competition running during that time. Um, sorry, and we've got the other one. Uh, if you're joining us and you just happen to come across the event, brilliant, welcome, thank you very much for coming, uh, joining us virtually. Um, if you haven't registered, but you found the link, that's great. On the bottom of the slide, now you will see a registration link where you can pop your details in if you would like to be contacted after the event by the amazing employers who are here today. Um, I just want to take a little bit of time as well to say that this is a highly interactive event. There's no such thing as a silly question and there's a chat box there, so don't be afraid to use it. Pop your questions in that chat box. Um, you don't have to use your own name. You can remain anonymous if you prefer to do so. We've got employers and speakers poised, ready to take your questions and answer and give their advice to you. Um, it would be great as well if we could, um, you could just test that, just make sure that works, give us a um, thumbs up or a hi, that would be amazing. So the whole point about today's event is to empower, inspire and educate you about the vast opportunities available to you within engineering and technology from the degrees that you are studying. You might just be in at the start of your degree, you might still be at college, or you may be just finishing a master's degree. Whatever point you are in your education or your studies, you will receive a lot of advice and um, content today that will stand you in good stead for the rest of your uh, start of your career journey. So we've taken... Um, a little bit of a snapshot here from every single employer that is featured at the event today, just to highlight why representation is important. Um, when we first started this event back in 2017, there weren't that many visible role models um, representing women in STEM. Um, and employers, websites, Chris paths didn't ha feature women on those websites. So this is brilliant to see all of this um, available now. Um, and it welcomes uh, new candidates. When you do go through to those employer websites, you can see instantly. Um, again, just going back to 2017, which is when we ran our very first Women in Engineering and Technology event. Um, it was pre-COVID, it was only in person, and we had 150 students. Um, today, we have got uh, over 1,500 students joining us virtually who have registered to want to hear more from our amazing speakers that we've got here today. I'd like to thank our um, employers, our sponsors, A System and Royal Navy, our employer partners, LSBU for having us here today, and all of our speakers who are dedicating their time to inspire, empower, and educate you. Um, 
this is not their day job. They're, they are here. They're not professional public speakers. Um, we're all a little bit nervous. Uh, so please welcome our speakers. That'd be great. Um, I also wanted to point out that this event to put together takes six months of communicating with universities across the whole of the UK. And I've been really overwhelmed by just the, the positive feedback that we've received from faculties, heads of careers, but also the student-led societies. Um, this year, above and beyond all of the years that we've been doing this, there's so many more women in STEM-related societies at universities, which is fantastic to see. It would be great, we're gonna pop a poll up in just a second to uh, just ask how many of you are actually a member of a society at your university. It'd be really great to hear. Um, we will be hearing from one of those societies um, at the end of today's event and the important work that they do um, and the, the community that they build to empower the, the female students within their society to, to be bold at their universities. I also wanted to do a quick thank you to Warwick University Teamwork. Over the summer, um, I was put in contact with six amazing students from universities across the whole of the world. Um, and together, they, we worked on how we could improve and develop um, the Women in Engineering and Technology event to, so that we were giving you content that you wanted to hear and that you would find beneficial and valuable in your early career. Um, so it was a fabulous opportunity to work with the team. I know some are joining us here today. Um, it was really great insights that we received from that and it was brilliant to work with the students. After all, this is an event for students. So that's enough from me. Um, Enjoy the event. Uh, we've got a whole host of fabulous speakers lined up today. And I'd like to start now by introducing our first, which is uh, Dr. Suella Kalichi from LSBU. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. Um, Welcome to LSBU, welcome to our vibrant university. Some of you had to travel today, but for those of you that are online, LSBU is right there in the heart of London, as you can see, a stone throw away from London famous uh, landmarks. So we are very delighted, absolutely excited to see you today. Uh, it's amazing to see so passionate individual, amazing to see uh, industry partners joining us today and it shows that you know, women in engineering and technology has progressed quite a lot, as Amanda was showing, in the early days. I remember in one of the outreach activities I was organising a few years back, I was asking students that what did they think or what a women engineer would look like, and they said, or an engineer, and they told me Bob the Builder. So, but the, the things have changed quite a lot, and it's fantastic to see, you know, so many of you here today. So, before we move into you know, the full event of the day, I just thought to give a glimpse of LSBU, interesting history. We started, or we were founded back in, eight, uh, in 1892, and we were one of the first universities in UK to open courses for engineering for women. So we have been continuing that progressive vision and then continued into the, in, uh, well, in combination with innovation and we have enriched our journey quite a lot. And if you can see on your screens, you have, for example, one of the uh, uh, main achievement, not the main, one of the achievements has been in uh, Mad Dog Two, as you can see it on the screen, proudly sitting in the Science Museum, showing the LSBU commitment to progress a renewable solution, but above all is to empower and inspire the future engineers, and that is you and everyone else. 
So uh, in terms of LSBU, we take pride in being, you know, top London university, top uh, modern university. And as you can see, we also are third in the world for reducing in inequality. So we're very proud of the achievement. Our students are also uh, one of them amongst the highest paid uh, in average um, uh, along their peers. So we have a degree, a range of degrees in various areas or disciplines of engineering. So this varies from chemical engineering and energy engineering to mechanical, electronic uh, and electrical and computer science and informatics. So we are doing research in some very exciting areas, as you can see on the screen. And we, we do research from computational materials design to materials production, to energy storage, sustainability, and artificial intelligence, some of the areas that we do work. We have around 255, uh, 250 plus PhD students. So they continue from after they finish their degree and the master, they continue into the research program. And actually today you will hear from one of our uh, PhD researchers that actually she will provide insight into her journey and to the research into uh, any of the global challenges areas. 95% of our research is deemed to be uh, internationally recognized and we have around 25 million of, uh, million of funding, which actually enables us to do this research, solve the global challenges, because we all know engineers are there to solve the global challenges. We are really student focused, so we take pride in our uh, support that we provide for the students. As we can see from the ranking, we are top ranked for student satisfaction in the diverse areas of engineering that actually we deliver here at LSBU. We have strong links with industry uh, and also we are committed to support our community. This is, enables us to, do, uh, to work in the areas that industry needs and to benefit the society. One of the things that I want to highlight is the advanced uh, energy, is the Energy Advice Centre. This is a student-led initiative. This is supported by Mayor of London and uh, by the, uh, no, this is actually, is a student-led one, supported by Southwark uh, uh, community and uh, borough, which actually it works with local communities to provide support in terms of reducing energy uh, consumption and uh, supporting the uh, energy bills, etc. And to conclude, I, I would just like to say and close with the sentence or the, the, the word saying that for every successful engineer, there is a supportive community. This is your family, these are your friends, these are your peers, this is your college, this is your university, and these are the people around you. Without them, it will be impossible to do it. Also, there is a lot of cup of coffees between. So I would like to tell you, take this opportunity today, make the most of it, talk to the industry, new uh, connections, check a new pathway and enjoy it. And thank you to Campus Media for bringing us to together. Thank you to the industry partners for joining us and thank you to you for being here today. So enjoy the event. That was really great. Thank you very much, Suella. We're straight on to our next speaker now. We've got Hannah Thompson from Our Systems, and she's our first keynote speaker. Thank you. Where do you see yourself in five years? That used to be a relatively simple question. Actually, the most challenging part about that was the diplomacy required to tell your interviewer that ultimately in five years you wanted their job. But that's become somewhat more complex now. In this rapidly changing world that we find ourselves in, the landscape is changing every five to ten years. There are dream jobs that we don't even know exist yet that will emerge in the next five years. So how could we possibly know what we want to be in five years' time? That complexity brings with it challenge. 
but it also brings opportunity. There's never been a better time to join engineering and technology and to be at the forefront of that change shaping the future. Yet for women, there's somewhat of a barrier. And that's in the form of a lack of role models, particularly in leadership roles. And the more we focus on that, the more time we give it, the more daunting that can feel. So what can we focus on instead? Where can we put our time? I believe that we can empower ourselves and one another to be our most authentic selves and to excel in our careers by doing so. Don't try to fit the mold. It's far more impressive and far more powerful to succeed in your career as your true self. Today, I'd like to share some of the insights that I've had over my 13 years since graduating um, and let you know about how they've shaped my experiences to date. My dad has always told me to be bold. And early in my career, I learned to take every opportunity that was there. I took on secondments, I took on intervention projects, and I operated outside of my comfort zone for the majority of the time. That instilled in me a kind of boldness that helped me to pivot my career fairly early on and go and work away from my nuclear engineering roots and instead for a small manufacturer that under, made underwater lights for super yachts. Not just that, but it was a small manufacturer that was struggling financially. So it was a real challenge. But in the five years I spent at that small company, I gained insights and expertise that I could never have gained in a stable role. And by doing so, I earned my first senior leadership position at 28. Not every risk I have taken has paid off though. Not every risk I've taken has led to success. And that's okay too. One role that I served in was as the chief operating officer of a digital creative startup. Actually, a role and a company culture that turned out to be badly misaligned with my personal values and a very challenging period for me. Ultimately, a kind of a disaster, honestly. Uh, but I came away from that with insights and lessons that have actually been very valuable to me ever since. So my message here is twofold. Be bold, but also give yourself grace. We all fail sometimes. And actually, in our failures is often where some of our most valuable lessons lie. A pivotal part of my growth has been my journey to discover my personal purpose. I'm a huge fan of the Japanese concept, Ikigai. It's the identification of what truly drives you at your core. It's the intersection of what you can do well, what you love to do, what the world needs, and what you can get paid for. I feel very fortunate that my current role running a business unit at Asystem enables me to fulfill my dual purpose, to accelerate the energy transition and to support women in STEM. My mission means the world to me and it's taken on even greater significance since I became a parent six years ago. But why would a sense of purpose matter so much to you? Well, a sense of purpose brings with it a kind of resilience that it's difficult to develop otherwise. The get up and go to get through the day's challenges to align with your inner greater goals. And actually, that's a critical ingredient for success, particularly in the uncertain landscape that we're in. Actually, resilience and grit, the ability to weather the storm, is the single biggest factor in your career trajectory. Another tool for your personal journey is your personal brand. My colleague Vicky, our talented chief people officer, 
we'll be talking you through a workshop at four o'clock on how to craft your personal brand. I truly wish that I had had access to such guidance when I was starting out. So that's well worth staying tuned for. Your personal brand is powerful, especially when it's tailored to you, your audience, and your aspirations. It starts by understanding your superpowers, those specific set of skills that make you, you, and how they add value to those around you. Your brand will evolve with you as you grow through your career, but it should always reflect at its core who you truly are. I first encountered personal branding during my MBA in 2020. At the time, I was enacting a widespread restructure of a small company. And as such, the brand that I crafted for myself was that of compassionate but effective leadership. So blending empathy with decisive action. As I've progressed through my career, my personal brand has shifted with my context and I've used it to position myself for the making the best of the opportunities in front of me. But it always remains rooted in my personal values of courage and authenticity. So you have what you need to create the boldness, the purpose and the brand, but developing the tool set is only half the story. What about finding the company that will provide you with an environment where you can flourish? My recommendation is to look for these six things. A gender balanced senior leadership team demonstrating commitment and dedication to the gender balance. Authentic efforts to close any gender pay gap. Opportunity for women's mentoring and coaching programs. Progressive HR policies which show an investment in women. An environment where you believe you would be able to influence at any level. And most importantly, a mission that resonates with your purpose. For me, our system embodies all of these things and more. Making it a place I feel I belong and I know I can make a difference. Look for this same feeling and do not fall into the trap of believing that in your early career you cannot influence change. You absolutely can if you find the right environment. So embrace your journey with courage, purpose and the knowledge that you can shape the future. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, really great wise words there. I've made notes. Um, be bold, be yourself. And nobody expects you to be perfect uh, ever. Um, we only learn by making mistakes. Um, and actually some of the, the greatest findings and uh, inventions happen through those mistakes. Thank you. I'd like to welcome um, our First workshop now, we have Neva Brentnell, who's the London STEM lead um, at Stamazing, um, a fabulous charity that will be telling you a bit more about competition uh, with during the break. Hello everybody, um, my name is Neva Brentnell and I am a STEM Asian role model and a STEM ambassador. Um, I'm here to tell you a bit about my journey into tech, um, also about the STEM Asian Inspiration Academy and how you can get involved in the future. So to start with my, <coughs> my journey into, into tech. So I studied sport technology at Sheffield Hallam University and when I did that, I was probably one of about three women in the class of about 30 who graduated. Um, when I did my A-levels, I didn't have options for computer science or IC, IC, ICT or sport, which were my kind of passions. Um, so I studied sciences and maths, um, which led me to do this degree, which I did actually really enjoy. Um, it was very aligned to my passions. Um, and then after university, I ended up working in the leisure industry 
and I worked my way up um, till I became part of the IT team the head office of Fusion, um, which is a leisure operator. Um, and again, in this team, there's about six people and I was the only woman. Um, but I think I brought lots of skills. I had some first-hand experience in the leisure industry and I was a fresh, fresh face, fresh vibes. Um, so I think that was a good, good place for me to be. Um, I then went on to work for um, a software company called Gladstone and they managed the software that we used in the leisure industry. Um, and I had a fabulous experience here. I learned lots of new skills um, and I, at one point, I also got to travel around Australia, so I took a gap year, and I got to work for Gladstone in Australia, which was really good, so I had some, some work while I was traveling. Um, and then in 2013, I paused my career to start a family, um, and when I returned to work after my maternity leave, kind of the shift work and the early starts and late nights didn't work. I needed more flexibility. So I ended up doing a lot of charity work, um, various admin roles, um, and during that time, I also did lots of studying, so I learned coding, um, I learned lots about charity management. Um, and so those were things I was passionate about and I still wanted to do. Um, but I didn't do them for work, I did them as kind of on the side for my own learning and to kind of progress my career. And then in 2023, I took part in the Stemazin Inspiration Academy, uh, which I want to talk about more in detail. Um, and then I went on to join Stemazin um, as the team in February this year. So, STEMazing. Um, our mission is to be, uh, sorry, you can't be what you can't see. So we do a lot of work um, with women and working with young people to increase the visibility of STEM in early education. So usually primary schools is where we start. And there's three main strands for that. So we have STEMazing Kids, which is when we deliver STEM activities to mainly year three and four students in primary schools. And then we have STEMazing Women, which is where we inspire and mentor and champion women who work in STEM industries or are graduates in STEM subjects to talk about what they do to the wider audience um, and support them on their journeys. And then we have a newly launched um, STEMazing community, and that's open to all, so men and women. And we have allies, supporters, um, mentors who are working with people in the STEM industries, um, kind of a place for networking, learning, getting together, supporting each other. Um, and today we've actually launched a new podcast. So if you're into podcasts, um, it's called This Is STEMazing. And the first episode is all about Alexandra Knight, who's our founder, and her story and why she started STEMazing. So have a listen to that. <clears throat> So my year so far, I started in February um, and I've been privileged enough to work with lots of different organisations, um, kind of amplifying STEM outreach kind of in London and a bit further afield. Um, so I started the year working on a project funded by STEM Learning and we trained 34 women in STEM across London to deliver um, STEM activities in primary schools, 41 primary classes for children aged seven to nine years old. Um, I also attended a Girls in STEM event at Brunel University, and we worked with some year eight and nine students to talk about engineering and, and routes into engineering and careers. Um, in June, I led an INWED event with CBRE. So we had a local secondary school who came into their offices in London, and they did some practical engineering activities. Um, they interviewed the staff there to ask them how their career journeys had been. Um, and then the talent and acquisition team also talked about routes into engineering, like lots of different ways they could get involved in the future. Um, I have attended the Science Museum teacher engagement event where we talked to teachers um, across London um, about how they could get involved in our programs, a few networking um, events that we've attended, um, and just kind of, kind of branch out our, our network as well. And then recently I did um, a workshop on gender and pathways um, with the five organisations listed at the bottom, so the Royal Academy of Engineering, Engineering UK, WES, WISE and BCS. And they brought together a room full of passionate people about STEM outreach um, and we were look, talking about combined efforts um, to reduce the gender gap in the STEM workforce um, and also for those entering university to choose STEM subjects. And that was a really good day. 
<clears throat> so the Stemmies and the Stemmies and Inspiration Academy is run twice a year, um, and we've made a massive impact to the children, the teachers, and the role models that we work with. So for our young people, you can see from the graph, the blue line shows what they thought about the question, would you consider a career in STEM before our program started? So we had just over 50% who said they could see themselves doing a career in STEM. Then they had four engagements with our role models, and the green line shows what they said after that. So that, that yes figure jumped to 75%. Um, and there's a couple of quotes on the screen as well from the teachers about the program and how they, they embraced it and kind of used it and continue to use it after we've left, hopefully. Uh, so from this, we can really see how our program has made a positive impact in those classrooms, and those children are benefiting from getting a STEM engagement early on in their education. And then we have our women in STEM role models. So um, they take part in a three-month program with us. In the first month, they are given lots of advice um, and encouragement to come out of their comfort zone, um, to talk about what they do in their jobs, um, and to kind of speak to a wide audience than they may already do. In month two, they learn a set of STEM activities that they're going to take into the primary schools. And then in month three, they go out, they get, they're matched with the class teacher, and they go out and they deliver the activities. <clears throat> um, the stats show that only 41% of the women on the program felt that they were a role model at the beginning. So when they first join our course, we have a welcome webinar and we ask that question. And then we ask the same question at the end, and that jumped to 94%. So we can see that our program is giving them more confidence. It's, it's helping them to realize that they are role models and that they can go out and kind of spread that inspiration. Um, at the end of month one, the role models are tasked with recording a video about themselves and their journey and their careers and the things that they've done in their job. Um, so I've got a video of one of our role models on the current programme to show you. Hi there, my name's Alicia and I'm a software engineer. That means that I work with computers, I tell them what to do, I write using computer languages to help design things that make people's lives easier and help them do things quicker and faster. Being a software engineer means that I get to just solve puzzles every single day. I'm always problem solving and every single day I come to work it feels like I'm putting another piece of the puzzle into the big puzzle of whatever I'm working on at the moment. My superpower is that I'm really good at bringing people together to solve bigger problems than we would be able to solve on our own. So if I can't work something out, then I'm really good at bringing people together to help and solve something that we wouldn't be able to figure out on our own, but because we can work together as a team, we can work it out. When I was at university, I got to use a really high powered microscope and I got to see individual atoms of a surface. I got to see what they looked like, I got to see how they moved and what they did, and I got to take pictures and use them in my research papers. And the advice I would give to my younger self is I would tell her not to let anyone tell her what she can and cannot do. Because if you work hard enough and you really want something, then you'll be able to do it. Don't let anyone stand in your way. Um, we have a lot of um, those women in STEM uh, role model videos as well. So if you go to our website and look under role models on our menu, there's lots of different careers and lots of different things people were talking about as well. Um, so since the programme started in 2019, we've had over 550 women go through the programme to become visible role models. And they have delivered over 155,000 STEM amazing kids activities to children aged seven to nine years old. There's a few of the activities up there on the pictures. Um, so we need to have visible role models everywhere so that young people can aspire to the things that they believe they can be and achieve. Um, diverse role models are vital to inspire a greater diversity in our future STEM industries. And ensuring that women are equally represented in the workforce is key to realizing the benefits of a diverse team. So our Inspiration Academy in 2025, um, Amanda's going to talk later about how you can enter a competition to get a sponsored place. 
Um, but they, the programme runs from March to May next year. There's a commitment of about two hours per week for three months. There's lots of support from the team. We have webinars, um, accountability peer groups that um, are managed by a mentor. So there's lots of people there to support you on the journey. Um, lots of employers also give you volunteer hours as part of your working um, hours. So you can, if you have a volunteer who, who does that, that these, these volunteer hours can work towards that. And we also encourage you to sign up as a STEM ambassador as part of the programme. So you can start to log hours and kind of start that STEM ambassador journey. Um, and there's more, inspiration on, oh, sorry, there's more information on the website as well if you want to have a look at that. It's been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Neva. Um, we've been working with Stamazing now for three years, and every year we, we run this competition for the opportunity to be mentored, to work with schools, um, inspire young children to learn more about STEM, but more importantly, I think to make you aware that you are a role model to others. You can be a STEM ambassador, and it's a fabulous program that really empowers you to be able to do that. So we're going to be moving on now to our first panel discussion. We have a graduate panel discussion uh, made up from four of our employers. Um, but first, before that, I want you to uh, welcome our host, Zainab Adigan, who um, has won so many awards. Um, and she's here uh, representing AFBE. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit more about herself and what she does. And whilst that's happening, I'd like to invite our panel members to take their seats um, on the chairs. Many thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Amanda, for that um, nice welcome. My name is Zainab Adigan. I'm a senior structure engineer at Carbon Clean. Um, and what Carbon Clean does essentially is um, use innovative um, modular construction technologies to try and solve um, climate change problems. So what we do is latch on to any sort of manufacturing um, plant, suck out all the bad uh, um, stuff in it, and extract the CO2, and reuse it or store it underground. Um, now, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, when, I, when I told my mom I wanted to become an engineer, she said to me, why do you want to do that? It's for men. Um, and bless her now, she's one of my biggest cheerleaders. But it was just her mindset. And I say that to say, I think that is um, the mentality of quite a lot of people. And this was, um, so I did started my degree about uh, in 20, 2010. So this was quite a while ago, but that still is, is the issue now. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to echo here is you can definitely be whatever you want to be as long as you put your mind to it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I sort of did my engineering degree. I did a master's in structural engineering and I was in buildings for nine years. But um, as I said, now I moved away from that. I moved into the energy, um, I think, because that's where the money is. Um, <laughs> but I did enjoy my engineering career in, in buildings. Um, does anyone know the building that has a swimming pool suspended between it in Vauxhall? Embassy Gardens, yeah, I can see some people shaking their heads. So I didn't design the whole thing. I won't take all the credit, but um, I designed the floor plate. So um, the floor plate. So essentially, the swimming pool is seated on a slab that I designed, which I think is really, really cool. Um, hence why I had to kind of brag about it now. Um, <laughs> moving on from that, uh, I lead the schools program for AFBE. AFBE is the Association for Black and Ethnic Minority Engineers. And essentially what they do is um, they the, the two co-founders noticed there was a sort of disparity in um, with engineers that are from black and ethnic minority engineers. Hence, they set it up and they, they work with school students, um, primary school students, as well as university up until the way, um, up until when you're in your career. So um, if you'd love to join AFBE, um, we do a various am amounts of things specifically what we do in the um, schools program. So that's basically for 11 year olds to 18 year olds. We do career, uh, careers fairs, workshops, mentoring, um, employability workshops, um, and placements as well. Because I know definitely for me, I knew you know, getting a placement is very important. Um, what, I, what I think it is because it helps you to get sort of a lot of um, experience before you go into the big world of 
work. And I think it also helps you to really understand what that specific sort of engineering is, because engineering is so broad, right? You, you don't even... So I started off with a degree in civil engineering, but what I really wanted was to be a structural engineer. Um, but I didn't know that at the time because no one really explained it to me. And now we have so many different roles in engineering. It's so vast. So I think that definitely... Not, not apart from work experience, just speaking to the right people. So I do hope you use today as a really, really good opportunity to speak to the right people, ask lots of questions, and essentially enjoy yourselves. Um, I, without further ado, I will join the panel and we can kick off our panel discussion. Testing, testing. Okay, um, if you guys could just introduce yourselves, please, one at a time. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is um, Emily Hilton. Uh, I'm a weapon engineer in the Navy. I joined two years ago straight after my degree. Hi, my name is Grace Routledge and I'm a graduate human and organisational factors consultant or engineer at um, our system, which I joined just over a year ago. Hi, I'm Ellie Donachie. Um I'm a project lead at Colas Rail and I joined their graduate programme four years ago, so I did two years as an assistant project manager, and now I've been working as a project lead for two years. Hi everyone, I'm Kud Simon Drupo. I studied chemical engineering at Swansea University, and I'm a second year technology graduate at Virgin Media Road 2. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be looking at my phone just because the questions are here. I'm not being rude and ignoring you guys or you guys. So to kick off, um, I think this question is always really fantastic. What really inspired you um, into getting into what you do? And I'll kick off with you, please. So I had a slightly different route into the Navy. The Navy offers loads of routes for like getting in as an engineer. We can sponsor you through uni and all sorts of stuff. So I followed one of those schemes. Um, I signed up at 15 um, and I was told, don't become a weapons engineer just because it sounds cool. <laughs> it's exactly what I did. And it, I think it is really cool. Um, get to work with weapons and all the fun stuff, as I call it, um, <laughs> on a ship. Um, but yeah, it's what really drew me is like every day is different and it's not really a job you can find anywhere else working on the stuff I work with. So, yeah. Um, I as well have a bit of a different route into my job. So I'm not technically an engineer. I actually have a master's degree in psychology. Um, so it's a bit strange as to how I'm here working for an engineering company. But here I am. Um, I guess I'm working here because for our system, um, which is in the nuclear industry. It works in the nuclear industry. And um, because I just thought it was something different and cool to get into, and I kind of like the idea of doing something different and unique, considering I have a psychology degree. <laughs> yeah, so I also had a different route into my career. So I actually studied geography at university, and then I did a master's in sustainability and consultancy. Um, and a huge part of that master's was to do with project management. Um, and I really discovered that I enjoyed that aspect of it and I wanted to work on sustainable projects and lead sustainable projects. So that's what inspired me to apply for my role at COLAS um, as they really supported you in getting in working towards chartership throughout the graduate program and beyond. Um, and yeah, just the opportunity to lead on projects which contribute to sustainable transport. Um, I think for me, technology is such a massive sector and it's not just about selling products, it's about you know, enabling people to have that ability to communicate with each other and you help people in so many different ways. So for me, applying to the grad scheme at Virgin Media 2, I think having that ability to rotate in different areas, um, try out new things and have the, just the time and space to learn and develop in a role is really why I chose Virgin Media 2. Thank you very much, guys. I love how everyone's journey is very different. And I love how you didn't actually start off as engineers, but you are still in that engineering space. And I think that really just goes to show how diverse you can be. You don't have to be um, an engineer to work in the engineering space. So it's really about matching your, your sort of ambitions, what you love to your talents, and then sort of choosing your career based on that. So yeah, thank you. Um, next question is, what energizes you at work? Like, what keeps you guys going? And I'll start off to vary it a little bit. Kutsai, please. 
Um, I would say definitely the work ethic of everyone. Working in a team is so important, and I think you kind of forget that when you're at uni because you know, you've got your own assignments, you're doing your own work, so you're kind of working for yourself, but when you enter the company space, you're working with people you know, to kind of build a solution, to you know, um, deliver something, and when you see that team effort and you know, see that team play, and also the contributions that you make yourself, it really does motivate you to kind of wake up every day and be like, yes, I can turn up, deliver something, and people will recognize my talents as well um, for me I'd say it's quite similar actually it's working with a team so I work in a team full of engineers and as I mentioned I'm not an engineer myself um, and I find it really inspiring to see how the team work and how we can all come together to solve complex issues um, and I also get energized from work as it from um, seeing the satisfaction from clients and also the local community when we complete a project um, a railway project and you can see directly the benefits that it has? Um, well, I guess there's kind of two main reasons of why, what as to what energises me is firstly, it's the culture at our system. It's a very family feel oriented environment where you feel very supportive and it's very inclusive and a genuine, a, a genuine kind of family feel. And um, work in a team where I'm very well supported. So that definitely energises me that I can go in, be me and I'm well supported and I can learn and I'm and every day is a different day. Everything is changes every day. It's no two days are the same. And I think secondly is the fact, again, working in energy, specifically nuclear, and how important that is to help the UK's goal in net achieving net zero. So I think by um, which is a cause close to my heart, helping with like global warming and climate change. So that also energizes me to kind of help reach that goal, which is also a personal goal of mine. <laughs> Uh, I think, again, it's people. When you're on a ship, you're all working towards that common goal and you're all trying to get that ship at sea. You're all trying to get trials done. You're all trying to get that operational capability and be out on operations. And like that, working with other people that also want that, is, it, it can't be beaten. So, No, um, I completely agree. I think being, you know, you work with people, how long, seven and a half days, uh, seven and a half hours a day. Imagine not liking those people. That's insane, right? I wouldn't want to do that. So I definitely, knew that really resonates with me. Um, and also just thinking about, it's not just about does a company um, fit, uh, do you fit a company? It's about how does that company actually fit into what you're about and you know your personal brand? And that moves me on to the next question very nicely. What does personal brand mean to you guys? Um, could I be start off, please? I would say, um, you know, kind of going from a student, you're all kind of put in the, you know, the same category, the same criteria. But when you actually go out into um, the world of work, you know, there's a sea of people. There's a sea of people doing the same thing, different things. But personal brand, I think, is really about getting yourself out there, exploring. It's this kind of a new stage for you to kind of springboard on other areas, see what you enjoy, see what you don't enjoy, and really just maximise on your talents and also focus on your weaknesses as well. I think that's kind of, you know, an opportunity as well but yeah just all about developing and seeing what opportunities come up and taking them along yeah so i'd say that your personal brand is it's how you see yourself and how you want others to see you as well so if you want to see yourself as someone that's confident who can lead who can contribute to a team um, and be a good team player then it's ensuring that you create those opportunities for yourself and take them when they are presented to you. So, uh, and I think that's something that you can build on over time. It's something that you can recognize about yourself. And if you recognize, like I said, weaknesses and you can develop those and ensure that you are representing yourself how you want to be seen. Um, I remember hearing the term personal brand from being at school really, and it's sounding very daunting having to kind of create a personal image for myself when in reality you already are doing that just every day by being yourself and it's not a word or a phrase or a mot motto you live by necessarily it is your personality traits what you believe in and all of that that makes you you and that you know you go around you ask your family friends whoever you will have one already and it's yeah not as daunting as it seems <laughs> To be totally honest, personal brand is something I heard for the first time today. <laughs> um, but reputation is definitely a huge thing. And having a good reputation and working for those around you, I think, is really, really important. And making sure that your team feel safe and that they're empowered to do their jobs is what really matters. 
No, absolutely. And it's okay that you just heard about it today because maybe a, a lot of people in the room only heard about it today as well. And like you said, it doesn't actually matter about is what is your personal brand. Do you have to write it down? It's it's just who you are. And that goes, goes back to always being yourself. Um, you don't necessarily always have to allow the world to mould you to be um, what they want you to be. You be your authentic self at all times and let your talent and your experience and your knowledge speak for itself. Um, I'm going to switch up now, guys. So you answer the questions as you feel if it's more relevant to you. Um, so this question is, uh, what initiatives do your companies have to um, help with women advancements within the company? Um, I'll go. Um, so at Colas, we've recently partnered with the Women in Engineering Society um, and set up a mentoring program with them. So for senior females in the business, they can sign up and become a mentor themselves to women from all, like, all different organisations. Um, or like myself, if you're relatively early on in your career, you can sign up and you can find a mentor from, it might be from your company, it might be a female from another company, um, and just set up regular sessions with them. I think mentoring is a great opportunity to build your network and to learn from other people and to help identify ways in which you can shape your career um, and to learn about different opportunities as well. So that's just, just one of the ways that Colas are supporting women in their careers. Uh, so the Navy have the Naval Service Women's Network um, where women within the Navy can get together and help each other out throughout. Um, I know it can seem a bit daunting, one, being an engineer and two, joining any uniformed service. Um, but there's definitely, we're all making strides for that inclusivity. So, yeah. Um, I think in our system, women are supported because well, it's very inclusive, diverse environment that is very well supported. And we have women in high reaching positions such as Hannah Thompson, who is my, um, who is in charge of the business unit that I work under. Uh, so I think just by seeing a female who is um, like in charge, like who has broken through that glass ceiling is, you know, very empowering and helpful and supportive of women. Um, I'm actually on the leadership team for the Women's Network at Virgin Media 2 and um, with the networks at the company, they kind of cover such a broad range of things. So I'm on the technology um, stream and I've done so many events. We've got quite a few mentoring schemes as well. We've got some reverse mentoring as well, which is really interesting. Um, but there is definitely um, that push to, you know, excel as women, especially like, you know, what's mentioned in the leadership areas um, having that mentoring around there. So, yeah, always a lot going on. No, that is very fantastic to hear. Um, this is specific to the Royal Navy. So how do um, how does the Royal Navy mentor women in engineering? That's a great question. Um, what I would say is, so I've just finished my like two-year training pipeline, so the Navy will spend time training you in what it wants you to do. And I wouldn't say it's gender-specific, but there's always people around to ask and help. And I think it's... Everything's an equal playing field, I'd say, in the Navy. So, yeah, everyone's there to support each other. <laughs> and, yeah, throughout training, there's, um, you'll have a divisional officer, you'll have people to turn to, you'll have the people in the job you're going to be in next that you can talk to, and there's always people around you to support you in any way they can. No, that's very that's very important, to be honest, and that leads me on very well into my next question. Um, so we all know life can get can life <laughs> um, and so how does each of your company support you with your work-life balance um, I'll go first um, as a tech company I think we're quite good um, in terms of you know working the hybrid um, working situation so with the work-life balance I think it's good because in my team we're kind of in the office kind of two to three days a week um, but I think that's still quite necessary in terms of the collaboration element but you know you have that kind of space to work from home and then when you come into the office you know you kind of have that you know collaboration space if you have any further questions and things like that we do have quite a few tools as well and platforms that we use so there's always like if you have a question there's always someone to answer it and there's always ways of working around things and um, they're very accommodating to different situations and yeah, just making sure that you feel most comfortable to kind of excel in your role. Um, yeah, at Colas, um, they offer we offer um, hybrid working as well, so you can have the mix of being in the office and being out on site, um, and then also working from home. I think it's just really important to have those open open conversations, sorry, um, with your line managers. Um, 
to kind of understand the balance that will work best for you and how it, will work, how it can play out in your role. Um, I think it's really important to, yeah, if you're, if you've got family situations where you need to be at home or different situations, um, it's just really important to communicate those and be open. And there's always ways of working around things um, to make it suit you. Um, at our system, we also have offer hybrid working and it's a very flexible sort of working arrangements and it's a very trustworthy environment to work in, culture. So, and a thing especially with everyone, all colleagues kind of help and support each other. So that really does help with that, and um, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Work-life balance in the Navy is an interesting one, <laughs> to be honest. So I'm gonna take the example of when you're on a ship. If you're on a ship and you're at sea, it doesn't mean you're constantly working, which I think a lot of people think it does. So um, in sort of normal running, you'll start work at eight, work till um, sort of maybe four or five o'clock in the afternoon and then there'll be circuits so you can go and do some like physical exercise on the ship um, with your friends there might be a wine and cheese night you might have a film night in the mess so although you are still on the ship if it's at sea and it's sailing I think it's more fun when it's like that but you get to know the people around you so well because you're in that very closed environment um, but then when you come alongside we respect how hard we work at sea because we work very hard when we're on tasking and operational. Um, there is that give back when you come alongside. So when we're in foreign countries, we try and let people get out and explore as much as we can. So it's, it's a give and a take with the Navy, to be honest. There are definitely times when it's a lot more work, but there are also times when it's a lot more get out, explore and all the rest of it. No, fair enough. And I think that would probably be um, similar to everyone's companies, to be honest. Like sometimes you get, you've got a deadline, so you have to work a lot, um, maybe for longer hours, but sometimes you can be a bit more flexible. And I know working the work-life balance for me is very essential because I have two children. So sometimes one of them might have a flu or I've just been called and said one of them has been sick, you know. So it's very important to be able to have the understanding from the very beginning what kind of balance you're looking for in any organisation. So that's really, really good to know. Thank you, guys. I'm just going to take some questions from the chat box um so we've got first of all um lara asked this is specific for royal navy again how would you describe your organizational culture that's a very interesting question um i can only describe my experience and i've felt really supported and the culture has been fantastic throughout when i've been in i've always known if i did have an issue which i haven't had um who to turn to and who to talk to. So a big thing is diversity and inclusion. Um, within the Navy, our DNI, um, every ship has a DNI lead and assistance, so, and it's very well published. There's posters up, you can see people's faces. So you always know if there is an issue where you could go. Um, is this answering the question? <laughs> no, it is. You're right. You can only tell, say about your um, ex personal experience. So I think it has, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and I wonder, Lara, maybe you want us to elaborate a bit more. Just please do put it in the chat um, if that if that's useful. Lives are so. Um, this is this is really helpful to understand that you all took different routes into en um, into engineering. Um, she's currently studying maths and economics, but really wants to get into tech and en in the engineering industry. So with a deg with a different degree, what did the recruitment team look like for your interview? That's a very good. So it's more looking about if you're not if you don't have a engineering specific um, degree, how did you guys, you know, s smash the interview basically? I guess this is more for you two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that right? <laughs> um yeah, so um I, yeah, for the graduate program at Colas, well, it, the one that I applied for, it was called the Future Leaders Graduate Program. There is a more specific engineering graduate program as well, if you do have that experience. Um, but the main thing that I found and what the recruitment team are looking for is your behaviours. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have done an engineering degree. It's more how you present yourself in the interview, um, how you present yourself at an assessment centre. Um, they're really looking for those key behaviours, so those key leadership behaviours that you can, for instance, you can know when to take the lead in a group situation, but also respect other people's opinions. Um, I think that's really important. So I think if you're looking to apply for like an engineering graduate role, um, but you don't have that experience, I think one, if you get through to that stage, um, it's really important to look at the values of the company and sort of tailor your, your application to that. Um, and 
to dem try and demonstrate those behaviours as best as you can, um, obviously while still being yourself um, in an assessment centre. I think that's that's really important. Thanks, Grace. Um, so actually, I did not join a grad scheme. I had a grad role um, with our system coming out um, of university. So while I was studying for my master's in business psychology, um, an alumni of my course came in and gave a talk about working in human factors, working as a consul consultant and working in the nuclear engineering industry world. And afterwards they said, you know, if this sounds like something you want to get into, we want to hire some graduates. So I had um, quite a direct route into it. I didn't go through a formal kind of grad scheme process, like recruitment phase, but I would say that um, one thing that kind of is applicable regardless of what job you want to apply for is, especially as a grad, um, they look for, uh, recruiters look at transferable skills mostly, um, stuff like teamwork, um, resilience, um, communication skills, time management, organisational, etc., which you can show through so such a wide range of things, not just from school and university courses, but also extracurricular activities, sports, um, volunteering, part-time jobs. You know, if you took on extra responsibilities in some sort of like um, sort of school council or like university um, equivalent sort of thing, you can def demonstrate those skills, and those are really important because those are harder to teach and they kind of l and recruiters look for these transferable skills and what you have learned from them and your personality you know so it's going back to you know showing who you are and being you and genuine because they are looking for a person who fits into that company and their values goals um culture all of that so i would say that's probably your best places to focus on thank you very much and just sticking with you grace um Rama asks, I would like to ask professionals at a system what your company does exactly, um, I guess in more in layman terms, and what do you look for in an intern? Um, as to my knowledge, I don't think, do we have interns? Just quick nod on, no, sorry, we don't have interns, sorry, I wasn't 100% sure. Um, so what was, was, is it what do we do every day? Yeah, so what does... So um, we are quite a broad company. We work in the nuclear industry in all sorts of, of industries from working in kind of new build of nuclear power stations to um, we also work in defence as well as um, I work in the risk and safety side. So all about managing health, safety, etc. in nuclear, which you can imagine is, very <laughs> is a big part and is important. Um, so we are consultants. Um, in what is what we do, so we are hired out in you know individually in teams. It depends; it can vary person to person, business unit to business unit, etc. I think this um, to all sorts of companies across the UK um, in the nuclear industry to work on projects. So they come to us with a problem, and we help them to solve it initially. Basically, um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I hope it does, and if it didn't, uh, please do um, <laughs> um, retype it in the chat. But I think you did answer the question, so thank you very much. I have a question. So uh, are A-System consider taking on internships at all? Not that I'm looking for one, but, you know, <laughs> just, just for, for the benefit I of the audience. <laughs> we don't at the moment, but in the future um, we will. But our talk around, we do have about 30 graduates applying for internships at the moment. Okay. No, thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, so currently, we do not hire interns, but it is something that you know we could be looking into doing in the future. But we do have a grad scheme, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this is another one specific to the Navy. So how <laughs> how very interesting to be to be fair. I can imagine. How often are you home? Very important question. When working for the Navy, is there support in place to help with adjusting to being away from um, from home for long terms for a long period of time? So again, <laughs> I mentioned before I had a bit of a different route into the Navy. Um, so I did like a boarding sixth form thing that we don't offer anymore. Um, so I moved out at like 16. So I'd say I'm pretty used to living away and at uni living away from home as well. But so for your training um, as an officer, the first 10 weeks, you can't really go home, but you still have a phone. You can still call people so you can still contact your family and all the rest of it. Um, and then from then on, like you have your weekends free. So like if you've got a car, you can drive, go see your friends, um, go see your family, or 
like you get to know people really well in training so you can do like car sharing and all the rest of it to get up and down the country wherever you need to go um sorry i forgot the question for a second um how how how, how often we get to go home so yeah in the job i'm in now home every weekend if a ship's alongside you'll be home every weekend um or you can live on the ship if you choose to i choose to live on ship because i just find it easier um but yeah you can go home every weekend um say you're on a ship in portsmouth and you live in portsmouth you can go home every evening um yeah it really just depends where the ship is and what it's doing obviously if the ship is at sea then you can't really <laughs> go home for the evening. Um, so deployments can vary a lot and they can range from anywhere in the world. But I think that's a real plus because you can travel the world. You can see so many places. I know the speakers we've got coming later on, they go, the amount of places they've been to is, I'm jealous of how many places they've been to. I want to do that. Um, but yeah, I think there has to be a realization in the Navy you're not going to be home every night. Thank you very much. So we have quite a lot of questions. Um, we have 15 minutes left, so it's, we're going to have to... I want us to be able to get through all the questions. It will be very nice. So, um, again, let's try and answer the questions that are most relevant um, and try and keep it short and sweet. I know it will be a bit difficult, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, so how is success measured in your company? Um, Kutsa, if you don't mind taking this one. Um, I think success takes various different forms um, depending on which team you're working in. So I've done quite a few roles. I've done um, a network planning role. I've done a cloud team role and I'm currently a business manager for the chief of staff office as well. So those are quite varied roles and I did an internship in design. Um, so it really depends on which area you're in. For example, if you're working in project work, um, I guess you have that big deadline and that's kind of what you're working towards. So that will kind of be your measure of success. Um, in my business manager role, you know, it's very agile very reactive so there's things going on all the time so it's not necessarily a thing of you can finish everything but you know just kind of touching on various different points but yeah I just think um, in terms of that um, it just depends on which team you're working in but on a personal front I guess just developing um, there's quite a lot of um, outlets and resources that we have in terms of personal development business development as well which have really helped me through my role and so yeah there's a various different measures of success I would say. Thank you very much. Um, this one is for Eleanor. Um, what does it mean to work in the rail, rail, railway industry? Um, so working in rail can mean many different things and particularly as being a woman, it can also mean different things for you as well. Um, so, so in my company, we work on railway infrastructure. Um, so we could do a lot of um, renewals of all the railways that are currently in place in the UK, um, updating them, making sure they're still safe, um, and also enhancement projects, so new, new railway projects, and also electrifying the current railway that we have. Um, so working in rail really means that you get to work on projects that, you know, people use the railway every single day. You can see the tangible impacts of the work that you're doing. So for instance, there was a project that we did in Wales um, where we reinstated an old railway line um, and my team got letters from people that lived in, in the villages in Wales that were impacted by that because it now that meant that they could travel much more easily to and from cities um, and get around much more easily. So it really improved their mobility. Um, and also it means you can work on projects that have sustainable impacts. Um, so one example, for instance, is our company's recently developed um, composite railway sleepers. So these are railway sleepers, sleepers that are made of 100% um, renewable recycled materials. Um, and obviously using them if they start to, as they start to get implemented more and more will have a huge environmental impact across the UK um, in reducing our carbon emissions. So yeah, it, it can mean many different things. Um, and also you can shape your career how you want it. It doesn't necessarily mean you're out on site every day driving trains. I think a lot of people had that perception. I know my family did when I said I was working in the railway. Um, and yeah, there's lots of different opportunities that you can take um, and really shape your career and make it mean what align with your values and make it mean what you want to you. Question, what is a railway sleeper? So it's what the railway goes on basically. So it's what the tracks are laid on. So, you know, in between the tracks, there's the little wooden uh, traditionally they're wooden uh, sleepers that go across and then you have the tracks that are bolted to them. So what were traditionally wood and then were concrete are now being hopefully made into 100% recycled materials. Very sustainable. Am I the only one that didn't know what a robot sleeper was? 
No, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, next one. <laughs> I like this question. This is from Georgie. How will AI affect STEM roles in the next few years? Are you trying to say we're all going to be extinct from our jobs? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone take that question, please? Um, I think this is a big conversation in the tech sector, but I think you need to see it from a point of AI can support roles, not necessarily just replace roles. So for example, whether that's making decks in a way that you can show infographics in a more concise way. I work in the chief of staff office, as I mentioned, and you know, you work with senior leaders and you see how leadership works. They have two minutes, you know, to see a PowerPoint. They have two minutes to read a deck. So we could have, we have like some AI impl implementation where, you know, it kind of helps us um, present that in a way that's feasible to read so it's not necessarily always about replacing the role um, so yeah it's definitely an exciting space as well not something to be super scared about but yeah no I love that um, and I was joking by the way um, but like I don't know if anyone's seen or anyone's um, geeky enough but I don't know if anyone's noticed that Python has now been integrated into Excel anyone know that no oh wow yeah okay that's very embarrassing but anyways it's that's <laughs> That's there to help you um, sort of support you in your role. So it will help AI can write codes for you now. So you can literally tell AI what you want it to do and um, you can write the code. So, yeah, absolutely supporting us in our roles rather than getting rid of us. Um, this is for the attention of Emily, by the way. Only half of the audience knew what personal branding was. So, um, yeah, you're not on you're not on your own. And I, can I just say that keynote was absolutely amazing. I definitely took notes as well. Um, next one. So. How do you manage a high demanding job with family commitments? Fantastic question. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, um, no, I don't have any family commitments, but uh, a lot of the people that I work with do have um, family commitments that obviously they want to, you know, if they need to take time off work to look after their children, if their children are ill, like you mentioned. Um, and I think to manage those it's just about having those open conversations that i mentioned earlier and being honest about your situation um you know the company wants to support you they want to help you you know you, you're working there they they want you to stay there basically they don't want to get rid of you um so i think it's really just important to yeah be open and honest and to understand that you know family obviously can take takes priority um and your team will be there to support you. Likewise, you can support your team if they need to take time off. No, absolutely. Um, and I think I could answer this one as well, just because um, yesterday I had a deadline, um, but pickup is at three o'clock from primary school. So I picked up the kids, brought them home, and you can imagine I'm trying to hit this deadline and someone's saying, mommy, can I have a sandwich, please? And it's like, no, not, not now. It is difficult, but also it's about making sure you're able to um, be very efficient with your time. Also, like you said, be open, having that honest conversation and saying, you know what, my child is ill or I can't meet this deadline. Just uh, managing expectations is very, very important. Can I jump on this one? Go quick? for it, yeah. Um, so the Navy will try and support its people in any way it can. So like when you're on ship, the maintenance period, we have a summer leave period and a Christmas leave period. So you still, wherever possible, get that family time as well. So I just want to say, you're not, you're not going to miss Christmas constantly and all of that with the Navy. We want to support you. We want you to see your families. No, thank you very much. This is a very good question as well. This is from um, Ebab. Eba, I think I've said that right. What are the most significant challenges I might face? Does everyone understand that question? Yeah, okay, anyone answer that? Um, if you're referencing kind of the role, I would say one thing, um, just from my uni experience, I'm quite a structured learner. I like doing pre-reads, I like having a textbook, I like knowing, you know, kind of the itinerary. Um, but going to telecoms, there's no textbook. There's nothing that you can kind of pre-read, it's all applied learning. Um, so for me, that was definitely a massive learning shift because you kind of go from, you know, being a high achieving person at uni and then you're, you know, kind of going from ground zero again. So I would definitely say there is a massive learning curve um, that people don't really, you know, talk about as much, but it's definitely an opportunity for you to explore and exercise your strengths and weaknesses. And again, it's not something that's scary because you will have the support um, there for you to help. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say kind of if you're going from a sort of education university background into a work environment, a professional working environment for the first time, there can definitely come be sort of an ounce of I don't want to say imposter syndrome exactly, but feeling like, you know, do I belong here? And yes, of course you do. Just, you know, everyone has started, everyone has, you know, started their first job for the first time. It's normal. And um, we all, we've all been there. And I think, you know, sometimes the sort of 
hardest challenge is can be to get over that and to realize yes I do belong here I am you know worthy I can you know be part of this bigger picture and I have worthy input to give and you know they've hired me for a good reason I'm not just here to go run and grab coffee you know I can <laughs> be <laughs> um I have a lot to give as well and not just to learn but to give to the company as well no thank you I'm going to try and limit our um, next questions to only one person just because I really would like us to answer all the questions um, but we'll see how we get on I've never had a mentor at any of my roles do you still have the same relationship with a mentor if you work remotely anyone so um, our company recently ran a new scheme for mentoring and reverse mentoring um, and so it meant that graduates, um, people on the graduate scheme, sorry, and those who had finished the graduate scheme in the most recent few years could be partnered with a senior leader in the business. Um, I signed up to this as I thought it was a great opportunity and was actually partnered with our CEO, um, which was a great learning opportunity and it really fostered a culture of um, open conversations in the business um, and it was great insight to see um, how decisions are made at that senior level um, and I think working remotely a couple of the sessions that I had with him were remotely just because you know he's very busy um, doesn't have that much time um, but you, um, so it just meant that it was just logistically I live up in um, in the north um, near York so um, and obviously the CEO well he's based down in London so logistically it just made sense um, to do a couple of the sessions online um, but a couple of those those that we did have in person were really beneficial and I do think for mentoring sessions it depends on what you want to get out of it and if you can you know either spend the day with them and learn from them for a whole day or if you've just got an hour slot um, I think it is really beneficial to to have those some sessions in person um, I think it can mean that the conversation can be a little bit more free-flowing sometimes but that's not always the case and luckily we do have things like Microsoft Teams that can help you um, support those from online wherever you are so it's just really you can have a balance with it I'd say. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, this is from Sophia. Are there any specific organizations or professional societies focused on biomedical engineering where I could connect with mentors? Is anyone able to answer that question? No. Um, Sophia, we'll take your question and, and try and answer it for you. Or if anyone in the live chat, chat could answer it for her, that would be fantastic. But we will, we will get your question answered. Um, <laughs> so this is a good one. How do you find a role with the right company culture? Very important, one person. I would say knowing exactly what a company culture is going to be like before you start a job can be very difficult. So sometimes you are just going to have to take that leap and find out. And at the end of the day, if it's not for you, like Hannah Thompson said, she was in a job where the culture was not for her. You can leave and you can find something else if it isn't for you, there's de always a learning curve involved. You learn, you know, tangible skills as well as things about yourself, what you do and don't want. So if you don't end up in a company with the right culture for you, then that's all right. Um, but there are kind of some so sort of kind of um, signs, perhaps, you know, when you research the company, um, maybe try and speak, f you know, talk to people, reach out on LinkedIn, for example, or go to these type of events as much as you can, in person, online, whatever you can. Um, and you can sometimes, you know, get a good vibe off of companies, hopefully, as to what their culture is, and just kind of take a step back, look at, you know, how, you know, maybe there, if there's multiple of them in, like, of people from one company at an event, you know, see how they interact with each other as well as to you and, like, other people there. And, um, yeah, so sorry. <laughs> no, very good answer, thank you. This is to all of you. Um, how many women are on your senior leadership teams? Very fast, you might not know, but um, <laughs> yeah, try your best. Um, this is a really hard one for the Navy because senior leadership team is in admirals. We've got a female admiral and more on the way. We've got female CEOs of ships. So There's females in leadership at every single level, so yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't have a specific statistic, but I do know it's over half of our senior leadership, leadership team at our system are females, such as Hannah and Vicky are both on that team, who are here today to talk to you guys. 
Um, I also don't have a specific number. Um, traditionally, the railway is a very male-dominated industry, but it's something that Colas are, you know, they're recognising and they're working towards improving females in those senior positions. So, yeah, I don't have an, an exact figure, um, but I know it's something that they're definitely pushing and working towards. Same here, I don't have an exact figure, but um, in terms of kind of like the CTO, she's female. Um, so we are working towards that 50%, um, but there is definitely some really good role models within Virgin Media too. Thank you very much. So we are at the end, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to take one more question. No, nope, that's the no. Um, but <laughs> thank you so much for your insights, guys. It's been very amazing. I know I've learned a thing or two, so thank you very much to our panelists. Can we give it up for them, please? That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Zainab. You are a perfect panel host. Um, I love those questions, and I really enjoyed the fact that there were lots of work-life balance questions in there, because when we do our pre-event um, insights, that was one of the questions that came up a lot. There's a lot of students, you think, well, work-life balance um, as a student, you, as a 46-year-old, um, I don't remember being um, uh, really concerned about my work-life balance at that age, but it is, it's a big thing now. So that was really great, thank you. Um, we didn't get through all the questions, I know you were really trying. Um, if the employers in the chat can um, tackle some of those questions that weren't answered, that would be amazing. So we're just gonna head into our break, but before we do that, um, you've heard from Neva from Stamazing, um, and we ran a poll earlier um, about um, if you would be interested in becoming a STEM ambassador or uh, receiving mentorship from um, other role models to be a role model in STEM yourself. And we have this fantastic opportunity with Stamazing. We have two sponsored spaces um, to join the Stamazing course. Um, Neva did talk all about it, um, but it, just to recap, uh, it is a four-month program, and it's really designed to empower you to be a STEM visible role model. Um, what you have to do to enter is email hello at Campus Media, and we'll pop all this in the chat as well. And we're gonna leave it on the screen for a while during the break. Um, subject line competition. I love it, everyone's taking pictures, great. That's exactly what we need to do. Stating uh, your name, course, year of graduation, and why you want to take part. Um, just to recap, this is the time commitment, which is very little considering what you are going to be getting in return. Um, and so I'll leave that on the, the um, screen for a little while, and we will be back in uh, five minutes. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you had a chance to stretch your legs and uh, grab more snacks and uh, drink to drink. So we're moving through now. Uh, the agenda is still on the screen of um, what's coming up. Um, but we're moving straight into our next keynote speaker, who Marissa Stevenson is going to be running a um, workshop keynote speech for us. Marissa is the director, space sector lead, and I'm sure we're going to hear all about that um, with Amentum. Thank you, Amanda. Good afternoon, everyone. When I started my career, it, we would have had to have cast the net far and wide to have this many women in engineering and technology in one room. So it's nice to see a room of women that are in this field. Um, as Amanda said, I'm our uh, Amentum's Director in Defense and Security for the space sector, which yes, does mean 
exciting things, space astronaut projects um, that we're involved in and that I get to be a part of. Before I get into that and a bit about what Amentum is and what Amentum does at, and our graduate program, I'll give you a, a brief background on my career journey. And like others have said before, it's a bit of a unique entry into an energy an engineering and technology. And my career started with the US Army where I was a signals intelligence analyst. And that was unusual because I had just graduated with a bachelor's degree in journalism. At probably your age, in my early 20s, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I grew up in a military family, and that sounded like a good idea at the time. And so that was my foray into a very uh, technical area. And I've kind of maintained that over the last couple of decades in my career. When I got out of the Army, um, I didn't know, again, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew I had this experience and I ended up moving to Washington DC and I got to spend time in the Pentagon and I started working in the missile defense um, field for the missile defense agency for companies similar to what Amentum is and what Amentum does. And at that time, I, I hadn't quite found my home in a company. And a couple of the other speakers talked about a cultural fit. Hadn't found that yet. Um, and then about 14 years ago, I did with um, Amentum's probably a company you haven't heard of before. I hadn't until a few months ago. And about a month ago, we merged with Amentum, and we were known as Jacobs Engineering before, which some of you may have heard of. And 14 years ago, I started working for Jacobs, and I was hired by another woman into a challenging role that I wasn't quite sure I could do, but she had faith in me. And that was a significant career, per, uh, career step for me that got me into more leadership roles after that. And I was in Colorado and coming out to the UK quite a bit and spent some time up at North Yorkshire at RAF Filingdale's. So spent a lot of time inside an early warning radar, which I would have never thought I would have been doing when I was 20 something. And I've also had the opportunity since I've been in the UK the last nine, 10 years to work on the nuclear side of our business as well. Again, I didn't know anything about power stations, what an AGR, PWR was, and I had the opportunity to travel to the generating power stations in all four corners of the UK. Again, another amazing experience. And uh, this is all, I found my home in Amentum because those opportunities are there. They're there for women, they're there for our graduates. And I've got a couple of my colleagues online to answer questions in the chat as well, who have completed our graduate development program, if you have any questions about that, and they're both engineers as well. The topic of today's discussion is going to be resilience. And I'll, I'll get into that. We'll go through an overview of Amentum and what the company's about. And resilience kind of alluded, and I've, I've noticed a theme through a lot of our speakers, resilience is one of those skills that you might not be able to be taught, but it's something that's going to take you far in your career. And I'll, I shall start on the slide, since we do have a few of them to go through. And like I said, resilience thriving through change and we're in a dynamic world, technology, technology is fast paced and we need to be able to keep up with that and innovate and pivot, which is, I think somebody else mentioned the word pivot, which seems to be a buzzword lately, but it's about being able to change direction and carry on and not lose time and keep up and, and, and stay ahead as well. And when we're talking about uh, defense and security, it is important to be a step ahead. There's a lot of information on this page. This is about um, our company corporate information. It is a US-based company, so this does have a US flavor to it. What I'd like you to take away from it is that we are 53,000 employees strong globally in 80 countries. That's a lot of opportunity for all of you. It is for me. Uh, recently, I've spent time in the Middle East. Again, I never thought I'd do that. And moving on to resilience. So here are on the screen, you'll see some key strengths about that. And as you look through them, you can see that those are things that you might not necessarily learn. It's not something you can really take a course on. But it's important that you develop your resiliency. And a lot of you probably have developed that res resiliency already. And growing up in a military environment, my dad was in the US Air Force, resiliency was something that was just a way of life um, from the age of two 
I started moving around every couple of years. I was leaving friends behind, familiar faces, starting a new school, and that was throughout my life. So I learned to change, to adapt. And there's three, three things that I associate with resiliency and what we look for as well in our employees, and that's adaptability, flexibility, and perseverance because you've got to be able to pivot, to change. When you're working with a client, they might change their mind. And you might be looking at a new solution, and you've got to be able to bounce back when you've got an obstacle in your way and figure out a way to get around it. And that's um, when we look at some of our graduates and, and some of the employees, they've got great technical skills, but what really makes them stand out is that innovation and that ability to maintain their optimism and stay positive when there is an obstacle. So that's something to keep in mind. You've got these fabulous technical degrees, but there's so many more essential skills. And our panel alluded to that as well when we we're talking about communication and bringing your authentic self to work because you all have those individual traits that companies value and that we need and that we look for. Again, this is a bit more and again another US um, flavor to this, but it shows our core markets and I've had an opportunity to work across most of these markets and the next slide We'll show some of the projects that we have in the UK. We've got about 6,500 employees in the UK all over. I've got another slide again that shows you where a lot of our graduate, where our graduate hubs are, and those aren't our only offices, but they're spread out as well. And these are some projects in, here in the UK, and I've been very fortunate to work on quite a few of these. Um, the Astronaut Selection and Training Project was a project we delivered for a, a overseas client, and it was about helping them understand how they could build their own astronaut corps. And that was pretty cool because we had an astronaut. You know, I got to go have dinner with an astronaut, and it's just the opportunities I've had of just, you would, I wouldn't have believed you if you told me when I was 22 that I might have these opportunities. RF, the, F-35 bed down program, we do a lot of work with the military, with the MOD, with the various domains, um, air domain, maritime domain, we do a lot of work with the Navy as well. And on the space side, we've got our commercial and our defense side of space, and we're invested and involved at Orbex, which is in Sutherland, very far north, and that could be a potential UK spaceport. So there's so much opportunity in space as well because it's, it goes far beyond just being an astronaut or launch. And those are things we do do. Amentum is also the largest solutions provider for NASA. So we have, we work at all of the NASA um, launch sites. I was fortunate enough to spend a week at Johnson Space Center several years ago and learned so much. And that's another key as a graduate and as, as you're starting your career, Continue to learn, be a lifelong learner, because your willingness to learn, say yes to any opportunity, and you don't know what you might find yourself doing. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about our graduate program, and I know there were questions earlier for the panel. We've got um, a very structured program. It's two years, and I wanna emphasize that it's a two-year structured program, because the slide does show that it extends to four or five years. So you've got your two years of a structured grad program, and that's gonna help you build your resiliency too because you're gonna be able to rotate throughout projects. We've got graduates who have worked on a defense project. I had a graduate who was working on our launch feasibility study, and, and that was amazing work that he got to apply his, his technical skills to. And then they move into, say, the nuclear industry. So they get a breadth of experience during these two years. And the additional years that we have are focus areas, and we've changed our grad program to reflect the feedback that we got from graduates who went through two years and then felt like, what now? They weren't sure what guidance they have. They weren't sure what their next step was. So these additional years help our graduates focus on developing their skills, achieving chartership, and their professional memberships. And as I mentioned, we've got, uh, I have got a couple of colleagues online who have recent and relevant experience with our grad program. 
our grad program also now is focused on hub areas where our graduates will be based, and that doesn't mean you have to live in these areas. It just means that if there's events, there, there might be a hub near you, and that's where our graduate support will be as well. And of course, we have remote mentorship and all of that as well as the virtual, as well as in person. London is not a separate hub, it is part of the Southeast Hub, but this is a distribution of where our current graduates are, where they've come in, what they're working on. And this is our QR code that will take you as well to our careers website. And reach out in the chat as well if you have any specific questions. And Amentum has a lot of opportunity for you, and I hope to see some of you soon with us next year. Thank you. That was really inspiring. Thank you. I've made a note of resilience. I'm picking up lots of buzz buzzwords today. Um, I think that's a really great example of don't be put off by the job title and don't think it's not aligned to my degree, as uh, Marissa has perfectly uh, outlined in her talk. So thank you so much for that. Lots of really great points. Um, introducing our next keynote speaker now is Lieutenant Commander Lindsay Aldridge from the Royal Navy. Uh, thanks, Amanda, and um, it's a real great pleasure to be here today talking to you all about uh, my career in the Royal Navy and some of the bits that are uh, critical to this, this speech about empowerment uh, and inspiring personnel. So hopefully you'll take something away from this today uh, going forward. So this is what I'm going to cover um, today. So you'll see I'll talk about my Navy career. Um, I've got some huge photos of me doing some stuff. Uh, empowerment, you know, what goals and what do we want to be? Education, so the professional development. I know a few questions in the poll earlier on. I'll tell you about what we do in the Royal Navy to then help people progress. Uh, and then a bit about allyship. So wh why it's important to have ma male allies in the workplace and um, also what makes a good ally. So yeah, there you go. You can see I joined the Royal Navy in August 2004. Uh, I actually joined the Royal Navy with a Bachelor of Science Honours degree in Sport and Exercise Science. So another one of those ones that uh, hasn't had a direct route into engineering. Uh, so after completing this, I uh, wasn't really sure what I was going to do uh, with the rest of my life. I was, went to university to be a PE teacher, got to my second year, decided that wasn't really for me. Uh, and then I wandered into the careers office for the um, Armed Forces, obviously all three there. Uh, and the Royal Navy took my fancy. Uh, they offered me to be a communications technician or an artificer apprentice, which was uh, an engineering. Growing up, I'd always enjoyed um, taking things apart, figuring out how it, how it worked, how to fix it, put it back together, um, always helping my dad fix cars. So that sort of is where I sort of took that line from with engineering going forward. So uh, I, my, my degree obviously had transferable skills. I've gone from movements of bodies and biological reactions to movements of equipment and moments to thermodynamics. So there was a bit of a crossover for, with the science background. Uh, and then I joined the Royal Navy, uh, completed my initial training at HMS Rally, uh, eight weeks there, before then going on to HMS Salton to complete my specific trade training to be an, a marine engineer. Joining my first ship then, HMS Lustrious, where I did watch keeping qualifications, operations of equipment, also doing uh, diagnosis uh, of faults on equipment and then learning how to fix them before going back to HMS Salton then to complete a foundation degree in marine systems uh, with U the University of Portsmouth. So after completing that, I joined my second ship, which was HMS Daring, which was a first -a class ship based up in Glasgow at that point, which was going through this last stage of commissioning. So uh, I joined that. We did a pan-Atlantic uh, deployment across to America, Canada. But then I also honed my skills into being an electrical engineer, which is where I then took a role as a, as a, to train personnel back at HMS Salton. So now training the personnel that were going to go to the Type 45s 
as operators and maintainers, so passing on the skills I'd learned to the future generations coming through. Uh, and then I joined HMS Queen Elizabeth. Once again, for my sins, I joined a shipping build. So um, doing trials and commissioning of new systems, integrating new systems. Also writing operating uh, manuals for the equipment that was being used on board. So it's not all work. There is some play, as you can see, hopefully, in these pictures. Um, so uh, whilst on Queen Elizabeth, we did... Uh, cocktail party on the Royal Yacht Britannia up in Edinburgh. Um, I also uh, did talks to South Today about the commissioning period of the ship throughout its, its sort of development. The top one was as we turned on the high voltage power for the first time. And then the second one was the day of the naming ceremony, which the, the Queen named the ship. Uh, and then, yeah, bit of a bit of a random rig generator there. Because of the high voltage on board, 11,000 volts, we had to wear specific safety equipment. So not the usual Royal Navy blue or white. I'm in some nice orange overalls there, um, which were supplied by industry. And I suppose for every female engineer in, in the audience, you'll find that they're designed for men. So these were massive. I had to roll the legs up, wear a belt, so I could climb around engine spaces to be able to commission systems. And then I was part of the Royal Navy Netball team that won the in-services for the first time in 25 years. Um, and we also won that year uh, RN Sports Team of the Year, um, which was presented by Pete Reid. And uh, if you didn't know, he actually joined the Navy as an engineer. So Olympic rower, joined the Navy as an engineer initially before going on to win all those Olympic medals. So moving on into 2016, I was selected for Warrant Officer 1, so the top of the ratings cadre, but also to be extracted to the Officer Corps. So I commissioned in uh, 2017, so 12 and a half years after joining the Navy as an able rate, I commissioned as a sub-lieutenant into the Royal Navy, conducting some further training at uh, Britannia Royal Naval College to hone those skills of being a naval officer, and also to on to salt and to complete any more trade training that I needed to do. Then I went back to another Type 45, so HMS Duncan as the Deputy Marine Engineering Officer. So whilst I was on here, I uh, did my Marine Charge qualification, which enables me to be a Marine Engineering Officer of a frigate or destroyer or a senior engineer on an aircraft carrier. So two years worth of hard work, three days of a formal exam with somebody else external coming in to see if I've got the right skills and to do, to do that. And then I moved on to a safety role. So I worked within the surface flotilla, um, looking after Type 45 destroyers and Queen Elizabeth carriers. So some risk assessments and going all that bits going forward. So there's some more pictures of me, um, as you can see. So these are from my time on Duncan. Um, all the various headgears you can wear in the Royal Navy, um, in an engine room, where are my number ones in tropical uniform? Baseball caps, berets, um, our tricorns, and I got to ride in a helicopter. So the middle picture is me going up in a helicopter. So um, yeah, just uh, some pictures of the fun things. But then obviously my favorite uniform of all is overalls. You ask any engineer, maybe not Emily, she's a WE, so that's a bit different. Um, but we like to wear overalls. Um, and anybody that isn't an engineer calls them our pajamas. They are the comfiest thing you will ever wear, and I would wear them all the time if I could. Um, and then that's from a tweet that the ship did for uh, Women in Engineering Day. So the Navy always put a post out, and on that day the ship's post was a picture of me and a little bit of my story. Uh, I think there's a video on Twitter somewhere as well if you want to find that one. And then, yeah, this is the diverse team that we had on board, as you can see. Um, there was myself as a, a DMEO, and then there was a MEGO, another female engineer, preparing to be a, a charge qualified engineer going forward. Uh, from there, I went back to Salton again. I think this is like the fourth time I've been to Salton, uh, and to do a specific training to take on the role of a marine engineer and officer on board a ship. So, um, for all your personnel out there, it's, it, for the merchant navy, it's a chief engineer. So I joined HMS Medway, uh, which was based out in the Caribbean. I know I 
sorry, it was hard. It was a hard life. Uh, conducting counter realistic trafficking and humanita humanitarian disaster relief. So this is anything from hurricanes, volcano eruptions to flooding in the area. So um, looking after the British overseas territories in the area. Um, visited a load of places with that one, which you'll see in a, a few slides time and a few more pictures going forward. My current role is a support role. Uh, I work at the Defence Equipment and Support Agency up in Bristol, uh, which I do marine system support. So any equipment that the Navy is currently procuring or anything it needs to change going forward with regards to marine systems, anything from a fresh water pump, a valve to uh, an engine comes through my desk at the moment. So, uh, so that's my role at the moment. And yeah, these are some of the pictures. So. Every engineering department, ME-wise, has to have a picture in the engine room. So the top picture is me and my team in the engine room uh, after we'd rebuilt a main engine. Uh, we docked the ship whilst I was on board. So um, this is a picture of the department underneath the ship. Uh, and then the other picture is the ship actually out of, uh, out of the water. So this was a, a case of I had to provide the, the correct sort of stability for the ship to be able to be taken out of the water to ensure that once we took her out, she didn't fall over. I did have a few sleepless nights before this, um, uh, given the captain reassurance that uh, we weren't going to, that wasn't going to happen. I sighed a big breath once we sort of realised that we were out of the water and, and sat high and dry, basically. Uh, yeah, so then from there, I went from... Caribbean beaches to the South Atlantic. So Caribbean beaches to penguins and icebergs. So as you can see, um, this was us uh, down in South Georgia. Uh, and the picture in the middle is, just, is my last day at sea on board Medway. Uh, that's a, a sunrise going through the Straits of Gibraltar. Um, and then, as I said, fast... Um, travel. I think I did 16 countries in two and a half years on board Medway, uh, traveling around the Caribbean, Americas, and down to the Falklands. And then some of the others are, um, whilst my time on Duncan and other ships, uh, doing the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, Caribbean Sea. But also, whilst I was on board Medway, uh, I got nominated for a uh, MBE, which I didn't know about, uh, which I found out about uh, back in June, so I was honoured in the King's Birthday Honours list with an MBE for my role on board Medway as Marine Engineering Officer. So, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about a bit more about empowerment. So, you know, challenging the norms to promote gender equality in STEM. Uh, so, the Navy's had the, f the first women at sea was back uh, in 1992, uh, and then. Whilst we were on board Medway, we recreated that picture for the 30th anniversary. So, as you can see, uh, that was all the females on board from the XO, myself, the other marine engineering officer who is in the other picture. That's us doing a funnel inspection together. Uh, so, yeah, the two, two head marine engineers on board the ship were both female engineers. So, uh, that was a picture that we had to take because in the Navy, that's very rare. Um, and, yeah, that, that was a really good day for us. Uh, but going forward, what's next? We've got women on submarines now. Um, I think the first female marine engineering of, officer of a submarine is is imminent. So, you know, sub, submarines, we have been on submarines since 2014. Ten years later, we've got the first marine engineering officer. Uh, we've got female am admirals, as Emily said. Uh, we've got commodores. And, you know, we're breaking those glass ceilings all the time. And you never know, one of you one day could be that person that breaks that glass ceiling for the Royal Navy. Uh, and then education. So, as you can see, the Navy's given me and people around me the ability to develop um, from further education and mentoring programs. So everybody conducts mentoring within the Royal Navy, uh, from the youngest AB. They teach the new joiner about the ship, how to get around it, how to operate systems. Um, we used to have the, the term, so sea daddies, sea mummies. Um, you always used to get given one, and they would show you around the first day so you know how to get off the ship, where your bed was, where you could eat. Um, so, you know, mentoring is, has been there since uh, day one in the Royal Navy. Um, and this is also recorded in your professional development. So the Navy has a CBD program, and you record it now, and then you can go forward, which then goes forward towards your um, professional registration. So I became a chartered engineer this year. Um, 
I went through the full, full process from joining the Navy, um, as you can see there. Uh, and then we have other awards and recognitions. So uh, this picture is of uh, my team on board Medway changing a salt water pump, uh, which on a main diesel engine allowing us to remain at sea. And as I said, yeah, obviously my own uh, MBE going has been done as well. Uh, and then looking at allyship, so, you know, the importance of male allyship in the workplace and why this is vital. Um, so what makes a good ally? So an ally is a friend, support system, or advocate of a person or group or people that often are marginalised in society. Um, throughout my career, I've always had allies. Um, you join a ship as a, as, a, as a female initially, or not just an engineer, and when I was on board Medway, uh, I was the head of the engineering department, uh, what, I had one female technician working for me. We got some more. You become that role model going forward. If you see it, you can be it. So I think, you know, everyone today uh, has done some amazing speeches. And I think seeing that going forward will, will mean that we will continue to grow as, as a group. Um, but, you know, the Navy's got many networks and each has got an ally. So as Emily said, you've got the Naval Service Women's Network um, who have got allies, there's a mentorship scheme, um, and that you can mentor, you can choose your own mentor, or you can, or you can be assigned a mentor as well going forward. Um, but yeah, as you can see, um, this picture is one of my favorite pictures. This was Medway doing a high speed turn uh, after we'd put the shafts back together, proving that the system works. Um, so yeah. That's a big point for engineers going as quick as you could, doing a handbrake turn, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so as you can see, the Royal Navy's given me a, a varied and a very rewarding career um, where I feel valued as an engineer. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. That was really insightful. Thank you so much. Um, I... I made quite a lot of notes during that. You touched on so many really crucial points. Um, I know we joked about it with the overalls, and yes, they are very comfy and oversized, designed by men. Um, originally for just men, um, very much in, in the organization. But this is why it is so crucial that more of you are entering the engineering, tech, STEM industries, um, because without a woman's view of that or um, your perspective, things aren't going to evolve. They aren't going to change. We can't change the world and make our environment good for everybody uh, without you in it, without you driving that. Um, I can't believe you just slipped in an OBE there as well. I think that deserves another applause. That's Amazing. So um, we're moving on to our next workshop, and we have the Chief People Officer from our system, Vicky Proctor. Thanks, Amanda, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off and just ask if you can do me a favour. So I'm going to ask everybody just to stand up, please. And if you're unable to stand or you prefer not to, just kind of wiggle your, shake your shoulders out, wiggle your, your hands. The reason I'm asking you to do that is because we've been sat for quite a bit and you've been intently listening to some brilliant uh, leaders in our, in our sort of profession and the, the STEM area. But actually, we're human, and we're, we're not designed just to, to, to be in listening mode. So keep standing just for a moment for me. OK. Um, I'm flashing up some, hopefully, some well-known company brands. OK, if you recognize all eight of those brands, I want you to remain standing. If you don't, please sit down. 
Okay, wow. For those of you that are watching at home, we have a full house of people standing. So let's have just a little bit of audience participation. Please just shout out from my left. What have we got? Come on, don't be shy. Ferrari, thank you. Microsoft. Pets. Amazing. Thank you. Um, you can sit down. I invite you to sit down. Um, so why is it that we recognize those brands just from a, a color, just from a logo? Um, those companies, those brands have a really clear sense of who they are. They've got a real sense of, of purpose, identity, and a clear brand product. And so can you. So, I'm Vicky, I'm the Chief People Officer for Assystem, and over this session we are going to be focusing in on personal brand. So I know it's come up as a topic already, I know some of you hadn't heard of it before, so Emily, thank you for, for sharing. Um, sign up, I think there were 50% of people online that hadn't heard about personal brands, so hopefully we can all take something from this. So I'm going to be talking to you about how to identify your personal brand, and if you already know what that personal brand is, then how do you go about communicating that to the world? And I think it's really important that each and every one of you here is able to unleash you into the, uh, into the world. So, let's start. So, who thinks that branding applies to people? Just a quick show of hands in the audience. Yeah, about kind of, probably about 60% I think we've got. And how many people here think they already have a clear sense of their own personal brand? Again, quick show of hands. Oh, literally a handful. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised, but that is good because it hopefully means that you're all going to take something from today. So here's the news. Whether you know it or not, you all have a personal brand right now, right in this moment, okay? Whether that's intentional or unintentional. Each and every one of you is beautifully unique. We all have a unique mixture of skills and knowledge, um, how we go about things, how the world perceives us. That is different for each and every one of you, and that's what makes you, you, and that is part of being your authentic brand. And today we're gonna to explore all about how you identify your brand, if you have no idea where to start, hopefully by the end of today you will, and how you go about communicating that. Um, but before we do, why does it matter? Why is this important? Um, well, we live in a world today that's really saturated. It's saturated with technology, with ideas. How do you stand out in a crowded marketplace? Um, each and every one of you here will have technical skills, will have technical expertise, but that isn't enough these days to make you stand out. So I've been a recruiter for far too many years. Over 25 years now, I've been involved in recruiting. And what I do know is that I take it for given. When I see a CV that comes in um, and I look across and it says I've got this degree from this university or this technical experience, great, that's fantastic, that is a given. What I'm really interested about is how that knowledge, how those expertise, how those skills are applied. Yeah, so how is it that you communicate that knowledge? How is it that you work with others in teams? How is it that you problem solve? What is it that you bring to the party in terms of that innovation? Um, and that doesn't come from just your technical skill bit. That comes from you and how you interact with the world and how you come across. Um, so I like to imagine your degree and the technical skills, they're still vastly important, don't think they're not, but they're the foundations. They are your building blocks. The thing that is gonna set you apart in terms of getting your career or opening the doors, whether it's to the next academic institution 
or whether it's uh, getting investment, whatever it is that you want to do in your career, the doors will open when you elevate yourself to that next level. And that comes from actually building your brand. So let's just have a look. We've looked at company brands. Let's have a look at some, um, some female brands here. One particularly topical, so we've got Kamala Harris, we've got Marie Curie, Kim Kardashian, and we've got Ada Lovelace up there. And what comes to mind when we think about those people isn't necessarily their achievements, but it's actually their identity and what they stand for. So thinking about those different, each of those individuals, they each had a very clear vision of who they are or they were, what they stood for or stand for, and actually how they either aim to change the world or have changed the world through innovation or technology. And the same applies to you. So what I want to do is we'll, we'll just take Kamala, very topical at the moment, I know. Um, but what words spring to mind if we think about Kamala and brand? Anybody want to offer me a, a word? Determined. Determined. Great word. Yeah. Safe pair of hands. Safe pair of hands. Absolutely. Her strap line, if you look through her campaign, was about being tough. I'm not afraid to take some tough decisions. About being principled. So I really stay true to what I believe is the right thing. And fearless, which I think is a really interesting word. I'm not afraid of taking on the difficult decisions, the difficult debates, the difficult challenges. Um, and each of you will have words that resonate with, with yourself as well. So how do you see yourself? Always a really interesting question. And is how you see yourself the same as how others perceive you? Um, my guess is that most of you will have some form of social media presence. So it may be Instagram, TikTok. Uh, for me, it's, it's LinkedIn. And whether you realize it or not, your online presence is part of your personal brand as well, and we will explore that. So how do we go about creating our brand? And the first thing that I just want to spend some time looking at is how many of us in the room today attach labels to themselves? And there might be helpful labels, but equally, there might be labels that can hinder. So a label could be, I'm too old. Actually, I think that might just be my label. Um, I'm just a graduate. I am not experienced enough. I'm a woman in STEM or in a man's world. Yeah. Or as my daughter frequently says to me, I'm just a girl. In that voice, I have to say as well. Um, so how many people have that inner voice that kind of sits, my mind sits on my shoulder. I don't know why, I can see one or two smiling, so I'm hoping it's just not me. But that really hypercritical voice that sits there whispering in your ears sometimes, um, that is the voice of limiting beliefs, yeah? And we all have a choice. We can choose to listen to that voice and it can hold us back sometimes, yeah? It can lead to imposter syndrome. We've heard about that um, earlier on this afternoon. Or we can choose to listen to that voice, acknowledge it, hear what's being said, but then actually really challenge that. And that's what I'm gonna invite you to do today. So let's take an example. So let's take the example of, I'm only a graduate. And let's have a think about how we can reframe that in a positive narrative. Yeah. I'm only a graduate. I am part of a newly qualified generation that is about to bring 
ideas and innovation into STEM. Just want you to sit with that for a moment. That feel any different? We're just reframing something. And what I invite each and every one of you to do is just think about the labels that you currently attach to yourself. If they're helpful, fantastic, great, go with them. If they are unhelpful, it is in your gift to rewrite those labels and do it at this. I wish I'd done some of this much earlier on in my career, I can assure you. Um, don't spend the time listening to that inner voice. So how are we going to rewrite our labels? Um, and I love the fact that we've already um, used the term superpower uh, this afternoon. But each and every one of us has either a superpower or superpowers, plural. And I really want people to think about, well, what is it? What's my superpower? And you might be thinking, I haven't a clue. I don't even think I've got a superpower. Um, you'd be wrong. Each and every one of us has something that we excel at, that we are brilliant at. We just might not know it, and we might not see it. Back to the picture of the, the, the kitten and the lion in the mirror. So how do you go about finding your superpower? Because your superpower is going to be at the core of your brand. So the first thing that I want you to do is reflect on your passions. Your passion fuels um, authenticity. Yeah, what you get super excited about when nobody else is watching. Yeah, is it coding? Is it taking things apart? Is it fixing things? Is it problem solving? What is it that really kind of lights your fire? So have a think about that. The second part to this is identify what your strengths are. What do you really value? Um, again, what are the things that you're good at? Take feedback from others. A really good tip as well, if you're really not sure, ask friends, family, colleagues, believe me, they are honest, openly honest, sometimes harshly honest. Um, but ask them for words that describe you. I've done this many a times, and I've just said, what, what three words would you use? What three words instantly spring to mind? And I can bet your bottom dollar you are going to have a level of consistency. Ask enough people and they will tell you. So for me, um, part of my brand and what I value is around energy. So I like to bring energy to things. I also like to be really authentic, be my true self. I can't be perfect all of the time. I'm okay being vulnerable. I'm okay making mistakes. That's part and parcel of who I am. And actually I think as female leaders, in STEM, it's actually really important that we are able to role model that. Um, and the third thing for me is about delivery. So part of what makes me me is I like to get something done. You can fill in the blank yourself, but that is my mantra. And the third part of thinking about identifying your brand is thinking about who is my audience? So who do I want to communicate this to? So is it potential employers? Is it, would I like to go on and do some more research um, at a university? Is it the public? Who is it that I'm really trying to engage with? And that will really help you hone your brand. So once you know what your brand is, you need to go and communicate it. Yeah, it's no good keeping it to yourself. I want you to be bold. We've used that word this morning. Uh, sorry, this afternoon, be bold, share this with the world. So the first thing is around consistency. So make sure that whatever you stand for, you're showing up in terms of, of words, actions, deeds. If you say, you know, part of what I like to do, part of me is about being a, a team player, being a collaborator, then you need to showcase that whether it's getting that across in a presentation, whether that's how you interact with a group. If I were to say to you that energy was my value and my brand, and I came on and delivered the presentation like this, that's not going to be authentic and that's not going to be consistent. 
So think about that consistency piece. It really builds trust with your audience. Um, I also want you to think about your online presence. We live in a world now that is online, whether we like it or not. So if you are online, you are posting content that reflects your passions. And I love today we've heard from so many people about what they're passionate about. And you can see that coming through in the presentations and the way that they talk. So make sure that if you're liking stuff, it resonates with your, your mission, your values, your writing or your commenting, and it aligns with actually what you want to get across. And tell your story. Um, logic, facts, hugely important in STEM. But actually, as humans, we connect here. We connect to personal stories. And that's what sets us apart. So tell people about why you got into engineering, why you got into technology, why you love coding, why you love building stuff, why you're interested in sustainable energy. Whatever it may be, share your story. Share some of the barriers that you've had to come to get here. Um, that's really, really powerful. And the final part of your brand is be adaptable. It, this is not a static thing. Your brand evolves and it changes over time. It changes with life experiences. It changes at career stages. Um, so just bear that in mind. You will no doubt stay core to your true values, but actually what matters to you at different points in time will fuel that passion and that authenticity. So I want to have a real call to action now for everybody in the audience, everybody watching online. Um, start today. I want everyone to be curious enough to really reflect and think about identifying their own personal brand. What is it that makes you, you? Take the time out to discover that. That's a really hard question, by the way. A lot of people are still pondering that. Um, communicate this. So think about, how do I show to the world who I am? Yeah. And really important, please tell your story. If you don't tell your story, somebody else will tell your story. And it is so much more authentic, so much more passionate when it comes from yourself. So I want to close by just sharing um, a little bit around ASSYSTEM. So we are, we're a global organization. I know somebody asked on the, on the chat before. We're around 7,500 uh, people strong, 1,000 in the UK, um, operating across multiple um, countries. Every year, we aim to recruit around 500 uh, people. We have um, our graduate campaign open. I've specifically targeted that QR code up there. We've got over 50 vacancies across multiple different roles, whether it's engineering, project management. Please do take a look. Um, we recruit not just on the technical piece, but we recruit on cultural fit. That is really important to us. Um, and I think the magic can really happen where your personal brand aligns with a company brand. And that is something that I'm really passionate about. And I know for me, some of our values at Assystem are around to dare. So I, I love that. I'm given the opportunity to, to, to dare and it being a safe place to do that. I love to um, deliver results. So that sits really comfortably with our results orientated values. So there is a, a, a kind of nice fit for me. So if we've piqued your interest, if you want to learn more about us, please do visit the stands. Um, we've also got a, a leaflet that you can take away. Um, and I'm sure for those of you watching online, you can scan the QR code and learn a little bit more. So I'm Vicky. You have been amazing women in STEM. Goodbye and enjoy the rest of the conference.
I think you can add another label to that, Vicky. Amazing speaker. Uh, that was really great. Again, so many notes coming through. Um, I'm going to ask my three young daughters uh, their, their word to describe what my superpower is. Um, and it, it better not be cooking. So uh, <laughs> I actually, um, uh, I'm a neuro spicy. I, um, anyone who was watching last year went into it a little bit. And all three of my children are as well. And actually, I think that in itself is a bit of a superpower. Um, it's definitely a label I wear, um, but it's definitely a superpower as well. That was really great. Um, also imposter, five minutes before we went live. Um, and cheerleader for you guys and um, wanting to champion uh, you to be cheerleaders and STEM ambassadors as well. Thank you. Um, we're heading into our final break. Um, so again, I'm going to leave the details of the competition up. If you have been empowered by Vicky to want to, to be a role model and inspire others, um, then please do consider uh, applying for the competition. Um, coming up, we've got um, the Royal Navy. We're going to hear more about their um, career opportunities in a bit more detail. And then we have um, our Graduate Employer Careers Advisor Workshop. So you've heard now from seven of today's employers already. Um, hopefully, if you've got any questions, now's the time to get them in that chat so we can get them queued up ready for that panel discussion coming up after the break so we'll be back shortly Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're into our final um, section of the event. It's gone by so fast. We've heard from eight speakers so far. Uh, so much advice shared, um, and all from really inspiring, incredible, trailblazing women. Um, our next uh, speaker is going to be um, giving us more of an in-depth um, view of what careers are like in the Royal Navy. We have Sub-Lieutenant Emma Grant. Uh, good afternoon all. Um, I'm Emma Grant and uh, I've been in the Navy for 27 years. I joined the Navy in, in 1997, so I'll let you work the maths out of how old I am. Um, so in that 27 years, I've had a varied career. Um, I've literally joined, uh, I joined the door, sorry, I joined the Navy without, um, my family wasn't a military family. I was born in Leicester, so I'm miles away from the sea. Um, I actually didn't really know what engineering was. It wasn't a, a subject that really was talked about much for females back in 1997. Um, so I literally joined the careers office at 17, uh, sat there entrance exams. Um, I left school without a single GCSE to my name. So again, I didn't go through the graduate scheme or anything like that, but it came later down the line. Uh, I joined the Navy as an uh, operator mechanic communications, and that was looking at uh, looking after satellite communications, radios, computer engineering, um, and uh, telephone systems, and that kind of thing. Um, that's what, how originally. So I'm going to go through sort of how the Navy is, and I'll then give you my life experiences along with it. So what does the Navy do? So we prevent conflict. In my time in the Navy, I've been in... Um, Iraq conflict in the year 2001 to 2002, and then also in Afghanistan 2002 to 2003. We provide security at sea. So we basically patrol the sea lanes, shipping lanes, to basically um, 
ensure that there's free transportation around the world. We build international partnerships that is either as a NATO organization or with, uh, with USA and uh, the Middle East, but also in the UK as well. So we work co closely with uh, British Aerospace, Talis, um, Babcock Marine, and all those industries as well. Um, we protect our economy. So believe it or not, 95% of all our UK imports and exports come via the sea. So we, we have an active role in ensuring that those seaways, again, are, are remain open. We provide humanitarian aid. So in my experience, back in 1998, the second worst hurricane to ever hit the Atlantic hit Honduras. And we were there to provide support, re-rig telephone lines, electricity cables, rebuild bridges to help the people of Honduras. So the roles in the Royal Navy as an engineer, we have three types. We have a marine engineer, which was Lindsay's background, which she talked about. And as it says there, it's all about maintaining hull, power generation, those kind of things, refrigeration, making sure the ship can move. That is their primary purpose. We then have a weapon engineer. That's what myself and Emily are. And we are the eyes, ears, and teeth of the Navy. We then have our sensors, so that's all our navigation systems. Our combat systems, which are big computer systems that basically you press a button, then the gun at the other end of the ship fires. And then we have our communications. So my background originally was communications. Um, again, it was IT network, satellites, roles in cyber, um, and then the weapon systems, um, so four or five gun, missiles, etc. We then have our air engineers, so that's obviously working with helicopters. Everyone's seen Top Gun, everyone wants to be an air engineer. Uh, and, but as it says there, mechanical, electrical, and air aeronautical engineering is required. And then the route, so I originally joined as a rating, uh, like I said, back in 97. And then about seven years into my career, I, was, I fast tracked quite quickly because they realized I was quite hands on. Like I said, I didn't have a GCSE to my name. Um, but then the Navy saw me, see, saw the potential in me and granted me an apprenticeship scheme, which I did two years full time study at uh, HMS Collingwood in Portsmouth under uh, Portsmouth University. That was fully paid for. I was getting paid. I had no student debt, nothing, and they gave me my foundation in electrical and electronic engineering after two years. As an engineer, you have hands-on experience, so you progress through the ranks. I made it all the way to a chief petty officer, where in my last unit, I was the WIO of HMS Scott, um, and I was the only female in my department of all males. However, there was no stigma there. There was no issue. We worked together as a collaborative group to get the, the, um, the job done to ensure that the ship went round and did what it needed to do, which was survey recording. Then uh, a few years later, as I said, I, I made it all the way to Chief Petty Officer. Again, um, because I demonstrated the ability to lead mentor, good communication skills, I was driven, I was motivated, I was determined. The Navy then invited me then to commission over as an officer, and which I commissioned last year. And now my current role is uh, working at um, MixG in HMS Collingwood, where I am the, basically the fleet communications intelligence officer for all the uh, communications, electronic support measures, which is equipment that's fitted to the ship. And I, I'm in charge of a team of personnel that basically roll out to fit this equipment to whenever it's testing for ships. But it's not all at sea. So these are some of the departments as an engineer. Um, it, the questions were asked earlier, how much time away from family life? You're not always at sea. There's a lot of uh, bigger industry in the Royal Navy that require engineers to be in. So going around the table on that, you've got the cap uh, capabilities and acquisition at DENS, which is where Lindsay works. I've also worked there, and, and in that role, I was a project engineer rolling out um, procurement or upgrades to systems on fitted on ships. We've got operational support, so uh, maintenance and repair teams. 
Uh, that's the position I'm in now. I'm basically uh, in charge of a group of personnel that go out to ships to fit the equipment that we've fitted on board to provide them frontline support. You've got policy, so that's a job at NCHQ down in Portsmouth or Mod Main Building, and that looks at procurement, and they require engineers in those industries as well. We then have our tri-service um, and optors. So I had an optor out into Bahrain. We've had optors all around the world, and they can be from six months up to two-year assignments. And then you've also got opportunities to be posted overseas in a two-year assignment to America or uh, Naples or various other places. And then personnel is, you can also be asked to be basically in charge of helping out with the HR of deploying personnel and assigning them to their other roles. There's also training. So I've also been a trainer, as Lindsay has, where I've gone back in. And as I've been trained as an engineer, gone back and then trained others to become engineers, basically giving them a positive role model. Again, the mentorship system where we constantly give back with, we take with one hand and we give back with another to make sure that we're constantly growing the engineers that we work with. But the perks of the neighbor, you have mates for life. So I'm fortunate, like I said, 27 years. The people I met as my sea mums, which Lindsay mentioned before, uh, back on my first ship on HMS Ocean, believe it or not, are still my very good close friends, and I still regard them as my uh, sea mums now. I go for them for advice. They've left the Navy years ago, but they're still my rock and my motivation to keep going, and they enjoy living their life through me in the Navy. You have unique team spirit. There's no I in team. We get a job done so much quicker if we're a team. We live and work together as a community. So believe it or not, you know, on a, on a, a tin ship sailing around the sea, you all have to get on and you motivate each other. But that bond becomes like a second family. You get to travel the world. I think it's easier for me to say now the places I haven't been to the places I have been. There's opportunities for adventure training and sporting events. I've literally gone skiing in Germany. I've sailed around Great Britain. Um, I've represented the Navy at the British Nationals in powerlifting. The, the list is endless. If you're into sports, you'll be sponsored through sports, no matter what trade you are. And there's world-class training. Like I've said, I've been given my degree with electronic engineering in the Navy. They're now obviously actively supporting me going through my IET accreditation for my ING, and then hopefully down the line when I'm promoted to go through my CENG. There's opportunities for engineers to reach, uh, to be given training in CCNA, um, coding. You can then sideways into cyber as well as an engineer. Um, the, the list is endless. Um, of all the opportunities that are available to the Navy, and that is why, uh, for me, every day is different. You literally, if there's something you're interested in doing, the military support you. And the offer, so the offer is 28 days holiday in the Navy. As I've said, fully funded routes to your I-Eng and your C-Eng. You're constantly developing a personal development, and you're actively encouraged to keep that personal development going. Free healthcare, I know we don't pay it for so much uh, in the UK, but dental care comes at a premium, and free gym facilities. All our gym facilities on board our bases are 24-7, uh, and there is gyms on board ship. We have Wi-Fi on ship, so even though you're away, you have that connectivity at home. Uh, non contributory pension scheme, the British, uh, the Navy's, well, the military, sorry, pension scheme is one of the best. And like I said, you've got opportunities for adventure training and sporting activities. Um, there's various sponsorships, apprenticeship schemes. Uh, I believe there's 47 apprenticeship schemes now in the Royal Navy. Uh, and if you want to click on the link and find out more or come and speak to us afterwards, we're all available. Uh, thank you for your time and have a good day. That was really thorough. Thank you so much. Um, community was the word I wrote down from that. Um, and it, it really is in uh, the Navy that it, you find your new family, really, don't you? They, they are your everything. You're, they're your cheerleaders. They're your colleagues. They're your community. They're your family.
So thank you. Um, I'd like to invite our panel um, guests down to the, the stage now, um, into the seats there. We um, are moving into our penultimate session. We're going to be hearing now from um, careers advisors and um, uh, a couple of other uh, people that I've thrown into the mix who I think can really offer some great advice um, in onto uh, what your next steps could be. So please pop your questions in the chat and we will do our very best to get them answered. Sorry, we were having a shifty around there because I have a comfort monitor right in front of me that tells me who everybody is. But now you're testing my brain. Uh, it's been a, a very, a very long day for me, a very early start, but I will do my very best. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we've heard from Marissa already, but just for the sake of anybody joining us now, if you could all just take a moment to introduce yourself what your job is, um, and um, I think it'd be quite interesting to know what you studied for a degree. Marissa, we know journalism for you. So, hi everyone, my name's Fraser Dawson. Um, I'm one of the recruitment business partners at Southwestern Railway. Um, I actually studied a, a sports degree at university and ended up doing absolutely nothing with it um, and took a completely different career path. So. I've now been with Southwestern Railway for five years. Um, for those of you that don't know what Southwestern Railway is, um, we're a train operating company um, that covers services across the Southwest. Hi everyone, my name is Ellie Martin. I'm a first year PhD student here at LSBU, working in chemical engineering and biomedicine. And my background also a bit interesting. I started out as a music major and second semester took a random intro to biotech class, fell in love, changed to biochemistry and molecular biology, and then did a master's in sustainable energy. Hello all, my name is Serena Tolek. I am the Global Early Careers Recruitment Lead for London Stock Exchange Group. Um, when I was at university many years ago, I studied international business management. Hi everybody, my name is Sejal Rahman and I'm currently a third year civil engineering student at the University of Sheffield and I'm here as a representative for the Women Engineering Society there. Marissa, please tell us who you are. Okay. The people joining <laughs> us just now. Okay, yep. And I'm Marissa Stevenson. I'm a, a director and space sector lead with Momentum. And my degree, my bachelor's degree is in journalism. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we had so many questions come in from the last session that, and we didn't get through them all. Um, and so I want to take a moment, actually, for the ones that I think would be really relevant from you guys to hear your thoughts on that. Um, so as people um, who obviously you're working within organizations who are recruiting talent, how important is personal brand? Do you look at somebody's social um, presence, uh, their social media brand, when you're considering a candidate application? Um, we don't tend to look too much into the social media side of things. I think when we look at applications that have come through, we tend to look at their reasons for applying for roles. Um, we sort of really try to encourage people to focus on sort of the role that they're applying for um, and making sure that it aligns with the role that they've applied for. We're, we're similar. We might look at, at their LinkedIn profile, but we're not looking at their socials. And a lot of the personal brand will come through in an interview as well. 
Uh, speaking for the academia side of things, I, I would agree. I think LinkedIn probably is a bit more relevant, but um, I would say research experience and the consistency of the things that you're interested in and how you present that, as well as um, I know academic Twitter is sometimes important to people, but I think people check it less. It's more for job opportunities. And we don't look at socials at all. Um, it might be included as part of your background checks. Um, so I will just say from that angle, in regards to what you put out there publicly, um, it will be something that will be checked in regards to coming into financial services. I mean, we're a university society, so our application is mostly a Google form. But um, I think when we're just looking at whoever wants to be a part of our society, but the membership's free. But when we're looking at people who want to join our executive committee, it's about how much you want to change the perception of like engineering and specifically women and engineering. So how passionate you are as like just from like an early age. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted that was hybrid of a question that had just come in about um, do employers look at social media and their presence and the personal brand. I just want to take a moment to explain. Um, we have Sajal on the panel discussion here, who is um, a spokesperson for the, the Uni University of Sheffield Women in Engineering Society. So it's a bit of a long one. Um, and the reason I've invited you onto the panel really is to um, explain when possible when the questions arise and not all questions are gonna be relevant for you all. So please don't feel pressured to answer them all, but um, explain how the work that you're doing with your society is giving you skill sets that can be used and are transferable skills that will make you stand out in the crowd, perhaps, when you're looking for jobs. Um, and same from PhD side of view as well. Lots of, lots of students who, maybe you're just at the start of your undergraduate uh, degree, so you'd be forgiven for not thinking you want to start a PhD just yet, especially if you're only in first year. Um, but not many people really consider that as that next step in their career progression. So I think it's gonna be really interesting to get two very different sides of the coin from some of the questions. So hopefully we can tailor them a little bit. Um, I think we may have asked this question slightly, um, touched on it to the graduates before, but it'd be really great to get um, the viewpoint from uh, the employers on the panel about how success is measured within your organizations. Um, success for us, I suppose, again, can come in many different ways. Um, when we're looking at success, I suppose we're looking at sort of performance um, and safety, um, but also success within sort of the smaller individual teams. Um, you know, each of the teams that we have within SWR, we're a very flat platform. Um, we tend to collaborate with a lot of different functions. Um, and just seeing an outcome that's positive is, is success for us. That's a good question. Um, at Amentum, we do have a, a, a formal process that goes throughout the year. And it, it has to do with a lot of conversations with your line manager on identifying what your priorities are and what success looks like for you. Um, and working with the client as well. There's a quality system where we do have um, formal surveys as well. But for individuals, it's, it's, a, it's a process that carries out throughout the year. Quite similar that we will have our formal process. So we set objectives each year, which are underpinned by our values. Um, and we measure on two different kind of spectrums in terms of the what and the how. And that is then recorded on a quarterly basis where you can go out to your peers or anyone that you've worked with in regards to gathering feedback. Um, I guess in, in terms of for our graduates that join us, they do join us on a graduate program. So there are some key elements that they will go through, which they will be able to really see what success looks like for them individually based off what they have been able to contribute to as well. Um, and then also see that being recognized in different ways. Thank you. Career progression is always a really big question. Um, and 
it, it gets asked so early on um, during a, an application process as well, which is great to see because they're, they're enthusiastic about um, wanting to stay there a long time and progress within that organisation. Um, so it, it's good to see how, how all of your companies measure that. Sorry, I am scrolling through questions coming in as well and trying to tailor them for everybody. Oh, <laughs> this one's quite good. Uh, can you share how your company supports career development for graduate employ <laughs> employers, employees? So again, you've, you've kind of uh, explained that it, it's a set procedure quite often. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of, uh, is there a, a set after your two years you can then um, apply for different jobs or you can move move roles how does that work once they've finished their graduate scheme yeah so I mean at SWR we don't actually have a graduate scheme in place at the moment unfortunately when COVID hit we did put it on pause um, it is something that we are looking to get up and running again um, we just haven't got a time scale as to when that is but in regards to sort of career progression and things like that um, it's something that we promote as much as we can we encourage it um, we send out new jobs every two weeks and um, we have some common opportunity. So it's uh, an opportunity for people to sort of dip their toe into other areas of the business and see how they get on. But they would just go through the normal application process. They would apply online, they'll see the jobs um, and sort of go through the standard interviewing process that way. And um, at a and I I think I showed this slide where we do have a very structured two-year program and the graduates go through rotations and there's they learn about project management, project controls, various disciplines, and then based on the feedback that we've had from our graduates and looking for a little bit more support in their career and their career journey beyond that structured program, we've now got an additional two to three years after that where we'll help them focus on chartership professional development, providing mentors and giving them as much exposure to different areas areas in the company so that they can that can help guide them into what they might want to do as well. And for us at ALSEG, so you join us as a graduate associate and then we have a career um, pathway, competency pathway. So everyone has access to the career pathway, which will um, kind of highlight in terms of this is the point that I am starting at and what is next in line for me. And then it will detail in terms of the responsibilities that someone would need to be demonstrating to move to that level. Um, so our graduates join as graduate associates and then our next level is associate, senior associate, manager, senior manager, so on. Um, so that's typically what you can expect coming through and then we also have two ways of being um, promoted so there's either that you're promoted um, because you saw an internal opportunity and that's something that you've decided to go for or it could be in role promotion so my role has expanded um, it's, I'm taking on new responsibility and therefore you are in a position where you're able to have that in role promotion um, we also understand as well for um, our tech um, workforce as well that not everyone will be promoted in terms of being at a senior level, which will necessarily mean there'll be a people leader, like a supervisor. Um, so there is individual contributors in terms of that technical expertise that you do still hold on to even at senior level. And that is also recognized as a pathway as well, rather than it just being to be promoted, I need to manage a team who then has a team underneath them who are then working on this as well. So there's a bit of opportunities, especially because of the spread of ALSEG as a, co as a company as well. That's great. Thank you so much. I think this is a good one for everybody. Um, oh, I've lost it again. There we go. What skills are important to learn for the real world that aren't taught at university? Um, I think we'll start at the far end. I think um, just coming to outreach events like this and speaking up and making sure you're getting your questions across and just having like an active participation in things outside the classroom. So going to networking events, going to events that are tailored to your course 
And just in my personal experience, I have something called the IC, because I do civil engineering. So we have to constantly update our skills portfolio. And that's not necessarily something that we are shown how to do in a class. That's something you have to, like, you have to go to the website. You have to see, oh, have I learned anything that I can say to show my future employers that, yeah, this is what I'm adding to my skills portfolio. So I think that can only be done by going out to events that are necessarily not just teaching theory and just talking to like-minded like people, talking to recruiters, asking them what they want in an application, in an employee. And I found that the answer most often is just having a real passion for the course instead of just like, having a decorated CV. And how did you first hear about the ICE? Um, that was actually at a careers fair in first year that I went to. So they were like, if you really want to show that you are on top of things, you're constantly updating your portfolio, make sure you get, you, because membership's free for students. So if you just become a member, you go onto something called the My Skills Portfolio, and you're just constantly adding to it all the things that you learn throughout your undergrad degree. So I, that was really helpful. Great, thank you. Anybody else? So one thing that I think is really important that you don't really learn in school is storytelling. I know a lot of very, very smart people to the extent that they struggle to convey the complexity of their work. And I think um, it's really important to be able to kind of simplify, especially if you want to work on cross-disciplinary work or if you're networking or if you're trying to get funding for something, you really need to have um, a, a simple, easy to understand story and a very um, compelling story. I would say in addition to that, try to get into the habit of um, identifying key concepts. So for example, in your courses, if you can distill concepts down to just a few basic principles, you'll kind of um, develop this kind of intuitive understanding of your field that makes things much easier to understand. For example, if you're looking at data, if you're trying to design an experiment, if you can kind of boil everything down to a few simple concepts, it, it just really makes everything easier. I would say an important skill, and we call them some of our essential skills, and one that comes to mind is listening. Uh, when we're working with our clients and we're trying to provide them with a solution, we need to really understand what their challenge is and what we're trying to do. We don't want to come in with a solution when we haven't heard the problem. Um, and as I've heard numerous times, you have two ears and one mouth, and you should use them in proportion to that as well. Great advice. I was told that when I graduated as well. Yeah, no, I totally agree with what you say there in regards to the listening, but um, it's looking at all the softer skills, um, but confidence is a big one, and I think now is a great opportunity whilst doing the undergraduate side of things to step outside of your comfort zone. Um, it's a lot easier said than done, but maybe go and do that presentation that you were nervous of doing, um, and, and that's the only way to grow. The outside of your comfort zone is where you're going to grow the most, and it's really going to help you in, in your careers moving forward. And would you say they're the things that you look out for in applications and in assessment centres where people have proven that they've done these things? Yeah, I think certainly at sort of interview stage, I think it's a, it's a real good opportunity for you to sort of ask questions to the interviewer as well. Um, you have to remember that these companies like us have shortlisted you for interviews for a reason of what we've initially seen. But it's also to, for you to get an understanding is, is that company right for you? So asking questions like, why, is, why have you been at the company for so long? What do you enjoy about the culture and things like that? So, Great. Somebody once told me um, that you should have at least three questions lined up for your um, prospective uh, employer when you're at an interview. Um, would, would you say that that's what you look for when you're interviewing? Yeah, I totally agree. I think a lot of people might be nervous um, to ask questions because they might feel like they'd be, be judged on asking questions, but it actually really makes it more engaging and it shows that you've got a real interest in the company and you've done your research and you do want to, to actually work for that business. Um, I don't know if anybody else would agree. Yep, I would agree with that. And it does show that the candidate is interested in the company. They have done their research and they are looking at, at getting involved in the company that they want to make sure it's a good cultural fit for them as well as it is for us. Great. Uh, Serena, have you got anything to add from Elseg on? Um, I would just say from a skill set, so 
we'll probably say dealing with ambiguity as something that you're able to kind of navigate through in terms of not only from a career perspective when you are joining a company, but also in terms of what might be expected from you from a workplace as well. Um, there is obviously a lot of learning that you would have done academically and sometimes that doesn't necessarily always just translate like for like, um, especially when you're going into say a, a tech more broader um, role where you might have studied um, a subject that wasn't as closely related but it's still technical as a discipline but it doesn't then have that natural translation like you would be studying civil engineering and going into a civil engineering role um, so I would just say in terms of dealing with ambiguity and in terms of where you are in your career as well it's always good to have the confidence to ask the questions, to learn from your mistakes as well. Perfect, thank you. I've got a specific one um, for LSBU um, from a PhD um, perspective, and I really hope you know what this means because I don't have a clue. <laughs> I know nothing about the PhD things. So what kind of opportunities do you offer for part-time one female architects looking to further their career? Oh, this is a, a really good question. Um, with respect to architecture, I'm not entirely sure. I, I actually have met at least one or two architecture PhDs. Um, and, and we do offer part-time PhDs. I, I know a few people. Um, I'm not, I will say, so when you're looking to do a PhD, there are a few ways that you can do that. So um, on the one hand, you can apply for a set project. This usually comes with um, full funding. And so you have to kind of follow the, the aims of that very closely. And um, sometimes on the other hand, you can just reach out to a supervisor and try to um, propose your own project. And then whether or not that's funded really depends on external scholarships, um, the money that the school has, et cetera. Um, so in terms of specific opportunities in architecture, I'm not really sure what we have at the moment, but I'm sure that um, if you reach out to someone who is doing work that looks relevant to you, you can get a good conversation going and go from there. Great, thank you. We've got a question in from Gordana. Um, just to the employers um, on the panel, how does your company encourage cross-functional collaboration and are there opportunities for employees to work on projects that span multiple disciplines? I'm, yes, <laughs> Marissa, <laughs> I was thinking this is definitely yes. one for you. Uh, there's definitely that opportunity with an Amentum. We span so many different industries, and the skills that you learn in one industry will be transferable. I know sometimes it's hard to see, but personally, I've gone from defense to nuclear now into space as well and missile defense. So if you're willing to learn, there's going to be opportunity and it's important, like I think everyone else has said, is networking and, and reach out and get to know people in your office or where on your teams and understand what they do. And you'll be surprised at the opportunities that, that opens up as well. And uh, Serena, LSEG, would you say there's an opportunity to work and collaborate across different departments or different disciplines yeah so not so much on the discipline side so because when you join the program um there is that accelerated learning and for you to kind of own your craft during the 12 months program so probably less so as you're um, focusing in terms of a discipline set that will set you through for the the 12 months what will come as part of that learning is project-based learning. So you're likely to move around on different projects as you go through your graduate, as you go through your graduate program, that's how it's been set up, that it's project-based learning. Um, so that's the approach that we would take. And then outside of that, we have networks. So one of our network is just in regards to um, innovation and we have various different networks that are set up. And that's where if you did want to do something that was more in terms of outside of your day-to-day -day, but network based as well then there is opportunities for you to kind of collaborate with others um, from different offices or different spaces as well. Perfect thank you and obviously rail um, we we heard um, from Colas earlier um, that it it's not just 
um, doing one thing, there are lots of different um, departments and functions. Is that the, the same for South Western Rail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I sort of joined the railway itself um, and somebody mentioned to me there was a job going, um, like many people, I probably looked at the railway and thought, oh, you've got a train driver and you've got a guard and somebody walks up and down the train. You might have some gate line staff that see tickets. And it wasn't until I actually joined the business that I realized that we had over a thousand different job titles. Um, and yeah, across with like collaboration, um, collaborative working, we've recently done some campaigns that you have to get so many different people involved. Um, and it's exciting and the opportunities are there. We offer also offer, offer like shadowing opportunities. So yeah, it's very much. Perfect, thanks. Um, why do you work for the companies you work for? Uh, I know this is gonna be difficult for our students here. Um, so again, it, it's just for the employers. Um, what, for, what attracted you to, to work for the companies that you're in now? We've heard from the graduates on the other panel. It's, it's here, your side. So I actually joined the business. I had a recruitment background previously. It was doing more sort of agency work. Um, and so I heard about the job through word of mouth through somebody that was working there at the, at the time who was really enjoying it. I joined the business and there was a saying, I think if you've done five to seven years, you're never gonna leave the railway. And I've done five now, so I think I'm pretty much there for the, for the foreseeable. But um, it's just that family orientation, that family feel. Um, everybody's sort of on the same platform. You don't feel like there's a hierarchy. Um, you could be talking to a, a, you know, a teammate and the director will walk past and join in in the conversation. And, and, it, and it's just, yeah, it's fantastic feeling. I think it boils down to the people like you've alluded to as well. And I've been with the company for 14 years, which has gone so quickly. And it's down to the people I've worked with, the leadership we've had, the advocates I've had, and the opportunities that I've had. And I always say I can do anything as long as I'm working with a good team and good people. And that's why I've stayed, because that culture is consistent from the top down. For me, um, I've worked in various different sectors. So started in engineering consultancy, moved to wealth management, worked in legal, um, real estate, commercial real estate. And then my last role was a tech startup, which was very different. Um, still picking up the same type of role in terms of early careers from a recruitment or development perspective. And for me, I didn't want to go back into the corporate world. So a lot of you will probably think, oh, I was like very corporate. And I had a friend, a colleague that was working there. And I said, just give me the lowdown. What is it really like? And she said, absolutely, you would enjoy it here. It is a place where, you know, there isn't that hierarchical in terms of structure. The people are great. Um, and it has lived up to expectations in regards to um, what I would expect from a workplace. We don't have the free snacks, unfortunately, like you do with a tech startup or the unlimited annual leave. Um, but it does have other perks as well. Brilliant, thank you. I'm, I'm reading quite a long question here and it mentions LSEG. So um, this is to the LSEG team, hi team. I have recently finished a SWE internship. Is SWE the company or is there a specific type of internship called SWE? I'm not sure about that. Um, with a derivatives exchange and it has since inspired me to pursue a career in fintech specifically the quant finances side. Does, I'm hoping this means things to you. I'm excited about the potential of joining LSEG as a software, en software engineer graduate. Could you share more about the type of projects that SWE graduates typically work on and how the company supports the graduates' professional development? That is very specific. <laughs> Do you know the answer? Um, so our quant and um, kind of derivative side equities tend to sit under our um, capital markets. Um, so that's where we have our equity side and our post-trade as well, which tends to cover more of the quant, so post-trade solutions as well. Um, so they do look for more quant individuals where it is a matter of um, that having that technical skill set, which would allow for them to go into a role that is more of a business focus. Um, and so it has the blend of the, the two. Um, so in terms of from a program, so then it will be our, um, as I mentioned, capital markets post-trade as a opportunity, which are open for applications now. Um, and then in terms of professional qualifications, so all of our grads 
complete a professional qualification. There's guidance in regards to what that might be, um, but typically um, they will do um, CFA as an option for many of our grads, but that's not the only one that is available, but it is a popular one for, for many. Perfect. Thank you for very specifically answering that very specific question. I hope that helps. Um, we've got a question uh, about societies. So that's good. Uh, Nilafa, I hope I've pronounced that right, says, would you recommend joining societies and what societies are available and how do I join them? Um, before you answer that, uh, if you're at university and uh, you want to learn all about the different societies, there are society fairs where you can find out where I'm sure you've had various stands in the past. Why don't you tell us about how people can find out? So I think... Joining a society is one of the best things I did at university. It really gives you a sense of community and belonging. You're, you feel more productive because you have something apart from studies or whatever else that you do. You feel like you're contributing to some sort of positive change. Like just being here, being able to listen to all, everybody and just learning so much more has already made like my week so much more productive. I think joining a society is possibly one of the best things you can do at university. And like um, Amanda said, the easiest way to do that is to go to your society fairs. They're always there at Freshers' Week, and even if you can't attend for whatever reason, I'm sure you'll find them on your Students' Union website, on Instagram easily. So we're available on Instagram. We're available on our Student' Union website. So whatever society is that you want to join, if you just look it up, I'm pretty sure you can find one. And I would suggest going to something that's maybe outside your course, something that's tailored to the so sort of stuff you want to do that you are not necessarily taught in class. Perfectly answered, thank you. Um, I can confer that every student union website uh, for the UK universities anyway, have an A to Z of every single society that is currently active for that year. And you just click on it, find out more um, and reach out to you, which is how um, Campus Media tends to reach out to a lot of these really specific societies. And I think you're right. It's finding a society that um, you're passionate about or have an interest in. And that might be a sports society or it might be more aligned with um, a label that you want to attach to yourself that we talked about personal brand earlier. Um, but I also want to add on that. Um, it's, I don't think it's compulsory whilst at uni to join your course society, but I also massively recommend that as well because as um, somebody who uh, runs a, a sector-specific event uh, or an industry-specific event, um, we also reach out to those types of societies. And I think employers do look at um, people who are active members of societies at university um, especially if you're one of the admins or a president or on there. And I think that that carries a, a great deal of um, skill set that could stand out on a CV. Is that something that you'd say that you look for in yeah, the application? Absolutely. I mean, we, we, we'll do an initial screen of um, applications that come through, but a lot of our applications that get sent over to the hiring managers are all anonymized. Um, so we take off sort of any sort of personal details and things like that, but having stuff on there about societies and things like that will definitely encourage them to want to shortlist you for an interview. Perfect. Sorry, we've got too many questions. I've got to move on then. Um, what's the best career advice you've ever had? Um, careers advice is given receiving the careers advice here. Um, we'll start with Serena. Oh gosh, I'm not the best person because <laughs> I don't, I can't recall good advice. Um, <laughs> it's, and it's really bad to say, but um, as I said, I went to university many years ago and um, unfortunately the career advice wasn't that great. I was lucky enough to join a graduate program and was able to have the experiences and learnings that way, um, but I can't think of a, a great piece of advice that I've had, unfortunately, and that's probably not the best answer um, to give, so hopefully you'd ignore this and then the, wait the, for the rest to, that, to speak that's, up. Let's flip it for you then. What's the best careers advice you can give to people here today? Um, if there was one thing. So 
with my ALSEG hat on, I would say interest and passion. So they're the two words that we would say. It's hard for you to put it down probably on paper, but when it comes to a process that you are going through, please apply the interest and show some passion in terms of what you might have done previously um, or what you are going for in terms of the opportunity as well. Um, everything else for us, unless you're going into a technical role, is teachable, so through skill sessions and, and those type of activities. Um, but interest, you, you can't teach someone to have an interest or a passion in something if it's, if it's not really there. Great. Same question to everybody. If, if you've got something to add, that is, you don't have to. The best piece of careers advice you can offer our audience? Um, I would say be open-minded. Um, I know a lot of the degrees that people are probably studying in, in this room can be quite specific. Um, but to understand how a business works and understand sort of other functions is only going to help you progress in the future. It might actually aid you in doing, sort of aid you in doing better in the role that you've gone into. Um, yeah, I would say there are some roles within the railway that we've got job titles for that you can't actually go to university and study. Um, so again, the big one is that transferable skill set to really focus on that. It's something I've heard recently, and I think it was at a Women in Defense conference. Again, another area where uh, you're going to be surrounded by men and you're going to be maybe one of the only women in the room. And someone said, we didn't hire you to not speak up. And a lot of times it's hard to speak up when you're a graduate, when you're a female in a room full of men, but speak up. Speak up because your voice counts and you're coming with diverse ideas and diversity of thought is so important. That's a very healthy culture. <laughs> um, I, I would add to this also, just throw yourself at things. If you apply to enough things, eventually something will stick. And I would say go for things that feel a little outside of your reach because as we've seen, like you can get them. And in my case, I applied to a bunch of things um, and basically one thing landed that I think really helped my career and I never expected to get it. So I think if you have the time and the resources to do that, definitely do that. Perfect, thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question now because we've only got a few minutes. Um, as, an, uh, as an undergraduate student doing IT, what can I do to add to my background in terms of skills and knowledge? What would you recommend doing? So that's, I don't know if, if there's anyone sp who can specifically answer that on IT. What additional skills can they do to help really bolster their application and make them stand out? So I think IT now comes in different forms. So information technology as it obviously stands, but isn't your IT technician that you might just naturally see or, or think. Um, so IT for us, information technology, um, computing, that is something in terms of as a discipline that will fit under STEM for us. Um, it will be more around some of the passion projects. Um, so what have you been able to do that has been outside of um, your immediate learning academically where you've been able to apply some of that learning but in a different way which you're not being paid for you're not being scored on um, so it really is coming through in terms of that passion and that interest as well um, so that is one element that we would see um, there are a lot of um, CVs that we would see as well where students have done um, short courses with some other institutes as well um, so really just thinking about um, some of the skills that you might be able to obtain through some of those short courses as well whether that be technical or whether that be more of a softer skill, but usually they are more technical aligned as well. Um, and then anything that might tip the balance in terms of that future skills that an organisation or the workforce is looking for as well um, is something that I would say would be, would be good learning. Great. There's quite a few um, coding um, companies out there where you can do a short coding course. Um, Girls That Code, I think, is one of them off the top of my head. There's quite a few. So maybe my advice would be just um, maybe joining one of those. If anything, just for the community and the networking could really help. You might find a mentor there, um, as well as it, it would be great addition to your CV. Um, 
this is a tricky question. Um, B would like to know if somebody, somebody who has done a year in industry has uh, a greater advantage over somebody who doesn't when it comes to a job application. I'll start with you, Serena. <laughs> um. I guess it depends. So yes, experience, any experience is good experience, but it's sometimes how you articulate that experience as you go through the process, which could mean that you wasn't showcasing your skills as as much because, you know, we'll see it on CV and then we're like, it was all there, but where was it in the room? Um, so it's great to have experience in terms of industrial experience, especially because you'll show in terms of what it is like to work in a workplace and also academically transfer some of your technical skills into the workplace and give you a little bit more navigation in regards to what opportunities do you like, don't like, culture-wise as well for a company. Um, so it does give you, I would say, it gives you an advantage, but it, like I said, it depends how you use it. And a Mentum or SW Rail? Um, sure. I think on paper it, it's not going to have a hu hu huge difference and it might depend on the role that's being applied for, but I think it's going to be what comes through in the interview. Are you going to be a fit with our company? Does that experience, what has it brought you versus someone who might not have and still is a fit? So it, it depends. It's not something that is black or white either way. No, I'd, I'd have to agree with those comments. Um, SWR, we're, we're massive on behaviours and values, so you could have somebody that's been doing the job for three years with all the experience, but doesn't do it in the way that aligns with our values and our, our behaviours. So if we have somebody that maybe has slightly less experience, but really shows a passion to want to drive forward and learn and be better, then mm. you know, it's, it's, like you said, it's not black and white, unfortunately. And I think year in industries, they're, they're great to have, but they're difficult to get. It's really competitive to actually get on a year in industry. So if you do, brilliant. But if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Um, there are so many other things you can do to really stand out on your CV and in your application. It could be you've got a part-time job elsewhere. You've got transferable skills from that. It may be you've done a course, a short course, and you've put that on there. Or you're part of an accredited body like ICE, ICE. Um, again, and you, you've attended events and received mentoring. Um, and I think it's not the be all and end all. Um, you can um, find other ways to stand out in your application or at the assessment centers um, and in the interview. And just to echo what uh, you've all said at various points is be passionate and be authentically you, I think are the best things in face-to-face -face interviews, um, especially the assessment centers where it's grouped talent and uh, employers are, are really looking for um, people who work together as part of the team, um, not necessarily stand out, but how they work together as a team. Um, there are quite a few more questions that have come in and I really want to um, plead to our employers and speakers who are in the chat to answer as many of those as possible um, before we, we finish the event. That would be absolutely amazing. Um, thank you so much for your insights. That was great. I'm going to ask, um, Everybody to leave apart from Sajal because you've got your session now and I'd like to invite the other members from the Sheffield University Women in Engineering Society to come and join on the stage. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah. I'm a third year chemical engineering student and I'm the outreach officer for the Women in Engineering Society at Sheffield. So let's start by talking about who we are and what drives us. So we are a society that is committed to promoting women in, into engineering and STEM careers. Our mission is to, take, is to make engineering and STEM fields more inclusive and diverse for everyone. Our passion lies in encouraging, encouraging women to enter and excel in fields where, where it is male dominated. Mm. Because we believe that by introducing women into this industry, is not just beneficial for the women in itself, but it is also beneficial for the industry in terms of in bringing new diverse insights and new ideas. So why, 
How are we working towards that goal? One way is by sparking conversations and hosting events. We are bringing more people into our society by directly going into schools and talking to them and encourage them to join in engineering and feel empowered. Hi again, everyone. I'm Sejal. I'm the Vice President of the Sheffield University Women in Engineering Society, and I'm thrilled to talk to you about our impact and the work we've done over the years. So over the last 12 years, we've been dedicated to inspiring future generations of women, and I'm proud to say that we're now currently at 800 members, both current students and alumni. So at our uh, society, we offer our members a ton of networking opportunities through events like this, through workshops on CV building, on by receiving personalized uh, mentorship from mentor program that we do. We are also always collaborating with uh, industry leaders and giants to make sure that our members gain a real insight into uh, the vast opportunities that this industry has to offer. We are One of our key outreach events that we're always a part of is called the Big Bang Fair in Birmingham, which is the UK's largest celebration of STEM. And this is where we really get to show our members how STEM shapes the world and how they can embrace the many career paths in this industry. Um, one of our key initiatives that we're the most proud of is our Women in Engineering book series that we write. We believe it's a very creative and unique way for young kids to learn about engineering, and they're all hand-drawn illustrations and stories written by our members. Another thing that we are very dedicated to at our society is working with younger children, particularly young girls, um, and through fun, hands-on activities such as slime making, paper plane contests, bridge building challenges, we try to show them how engineering is not only accessible, but also very fun and exciting. These are just some of uh, our pictures showcasing our outreach efforts. So we've been at Big Bang, we've been to New Scientist Live in London, and you can also see the covers of our Rick and Susie children's series books on the screen. To top it all off, this is a list of all um, the major accomplishments that we've achieved over the years. I'm not going to list everything out, but the main thing we take away from these uh, rewards and recognitions is the fact that this really shows our effort and our impact on changing the perception of engineering and how we can make it more inclusive and diverse. And it's also serving as a motivation for us to continue following on through the promise of driving forward positive change and always making sure that this is a welcoming space for not only women, but all kinds of people who want to be a part of women in engineering. And lastly, I think I want to end with the fact that we are trying to build together a community that fosters collaboration, knowledge sharing, and empowerment more than anything. I'll now pass on the mic to Anushka, our volunteering officer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my name is Anushka. I'm the volunteering officer for the Women in Engineering Society. Um, I'm going to talk about why our work is significant and how you can help us make an even bigger impact. So as Sejo highlighted, our society has been working hard to inspire, support, and uh, connect young women with more opportunities in STEM. So uh, engineering is for everyone, but the reality is that women are really underrepresented in STEM. Women make up only 28% of the science and engineering workforce globally, and just 16.5% of engineers in the UK. And this gap is a reminder of why we need more young girls to pursue careers in STEM. And our society is working to help close that gap by inspiring the next generation. And this shows that engineering is not just an option, but a field where they can truly contribute and thrive. Networking is crucial in making this happen. And through our events and activities, we connect students with professionals, mentors, and peers to support them on their STEM journey. And teamwork is equally essential, uh, equally essential. By working together, we create a community where everyone can succeed and feel valued, regardless of their background. But the thing is, we can't do this alone and we invite you to join us on our mission through connecting either with us or similar societies and endeavors across the country. Whether you're looking to participate or mentor or simply just spread awareness, your involvement helps us push the boundaries of what women in STEM can achieve. 
We'd like to say thank you for taking the time to listen and for your interest. We hope to inspire more people like you to join us on this journey and work together to shape a more inclusive, diverse and innovative tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't have put a better close on to our event than that. Thank you. Um, if you're not already a member of a society at university, then I think that's a really good uh, reason to consider being one um, and getting involved in um, activities outside what you're going to learn in the classroom as well, but also becoming a role model and a STEM ambassador. Uh, which we've heard a lot about today. So all that is left for me to say now is a huge thank you um, for you guys, for traveling to be here, for joining us online. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the, the speakers, the advice, um, and have been inspired to um, find out what your labels are maybe, or, um, join a society or push yourself out that comfort zone and do an additional course or go for a, uh, an opportunity that you didn't think aligned with you. Um, I've written my key words down. Um, resilience, be fear fearless and be your authentic self and find your allies, whether they're male allies, cheerleaders, your community, they are what are and who are who are going to carry you through. They're going to be there to support you. Um, and I think they're they're really important messages to take away from today today's speakers. I'd love to thank you uh, all of our sponsors, um, our system and the Royal Navy, LSBU for hosting us, our employer partners and all of our speakers who spoke so passionately. Um, thank you to the societies and the universities that shared this information with your members and your students. Um, if you've got feedback, please share it. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, what your thoughts are on the event. Um, and we will be sending around the on-demand version of this as well. So please share that with your peers, uh, male and female, and empower them to find out more. Thank you so much. <laughs>